selfless and caring mother of three. She always thought about other people. She was just a bright light shining. Viciously murdered in her own home. Her bedroom was incredibly blood soaked, unlike I'd ever seen before. There was anger involved in this crime. I remember just screaming. Investigators are sent down a rabbit hole of suspects. She didn't like him, she didn't trust him. It raised a red flag that there might be some sort of affair going on. She was jealous of her life, of what she had. There was clearly bad blood between them. Every lead appears to turn into a dead end. It just stalled. That was disheartening. Until a surprising witness comes forward. It was unbelievable. It was the break we were looking for. Exposing a killer no one saw coming. I was pretty shocked. I just remember being sick to my stomach. Portland Township lies in the heart of Michigan. It's fairly rural, nice, pleasant, kind of a good hometown feel. It's one of those areas that everybody gets along and when you're driving by their house, they're waving at you and it's just peaceful and quiet. This quaint community is stunned on Saturday, August 5th, 2006, when the Kent County Sheriff's Office receives a 911 call. Emergency. My daughter, we just found her in bed and she's got a lash on her arm and uh, she's all bloody. Just before 5 o'clock, we received a, a call of a potential suicide at the Pagel residence. Officers are immediately dispatched to the home of 41 year old Renee Pagel. We were met by Renee's stepmother and her father. They were both just in shock. Renee's father indicated that his daughter was in her bedroom. When I first walked into the bedroom, I observed Renee laying on the bed. I could just remember seeing all the blood. The blood-soaked sheets, her shirt, there's blood on her face. It was obvious that Renee Pagel was deceased, and it wasn't a suicide. This was a homicide. Officers secure the scene as homicide detectives arrive to investigate. Her bedroom was incredibly blood soaked, unlike I'd ever seen before. The bed was covered with blood. There was blood spatter on the walls, on the ceiling. She was stabbed multiple times. I was pretty shocked by the amount of wounds that she had. When I looked at her hand, I saw a large laceration almost in the middle of her hand to be, in my opinion, a defensive wound. Renee was in the fight for her life. Unfortunately, she had lost. For detectives, the viciousness of the attack is a clue itself. It appears to us it's a crime of passion. If somebody uh, has something against this victim so much so that they want to brutalize this person as much as they possibly could. This was personal. Somebody went into that residence to murder Renee. Who in Renee's life would want to attack her and could be capable of such violence? Born in 1965, Renee's spirit was always full of joy. Renee was the most generous person I have ever known. She loved life. She was always smiling. Renee Pagel devoted her life to helping others. She was a nurse practitioner. She had done medical mission trips around the world. And then she also worked at a homeless clinic here in town. She always thought about other people. Renee's greatest joy was being a mother of three. She loved her kids so much. She was a great mom. Recently separated from Michael, her husband of 10 years, Renee shared custody of her children while always remaining a devoted mother. The last couple years, because she wanted to be home with her kids and wanted to have some more normal hours, she chose to teach at 
a technical center. Even as a teacher, Renee found new ways to help people. One of her students had come into class one day and was really down, and, and Renee said, what's the matter? And she said, well, my dad is, is dying. He needs a kidney. And so Renee agreed to give her kidney to this man who she had never met. She was just so selfless, and it manifested itself in so many ways. Renee had undergone the kidney transplant surgery just five days before her stunning death. So she was already in a weakened state when she was attacked. Could the killer have timed the attack, knowing that Renee would be recuperating? Detectives look closer at her injuries, hoping they'll reveal telling details about the murder weapon. It seemed to be a very strong and well-made knife and large. Just the amount of uh, damage it did to the victim's body, it was at least an inch, inch and a half blade that was wide. There's no sign of the knife, but forensic technicians search the bedroom for other evidence. There was large amounts of blood that our scientific support unit had to collect, and they collected trace evidence like hairs and fibers for testing. Detectives continue to search the rest of the home. What struck me about this case that was kind of odd, there was no other areas in the house that were disturbed, that were bloody or anything tracked to the home. It seemed to be very honed in on just her bedroom. It really kind of puzzled us as investigators. It was the most bizarre scene I've ever been on. This person, in my opinion, had to know that they had to cover their tracks, and I think it was planned, and they thought this out ahead of time. As forensics continue their work, detectives speak with Renee's parents. Her father, obviously, he was extremely upset. But he had just found out his daughter brutally murdered. Detectives ask her father to help them put together a picture of Renee's last known movements. He last saw her the night before around 4 or 5 in the evening when he was picking up the children and bringing them to their father's house who lived approximately 15 to 20 minutes away from Renee. With Renee's children safe with their father at the time of the murder, she was home alone. He told us he spoke with her on the phone around 8 or 9 in the evening, just checked in on her because obviously he had a lot of concern of her health. Based on the state of the body, detectives believe Renee was murdered sometime between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. They ask her parents who Renee might have seen last. Her father talked to me about a tenant, Mike Decker, who was a acquaintance of Renee that has been living on the property for uh, approximately a year and a half, two years. Also, he did speak about a contentious divorce with her husband, Michael that she was going through. Mike wanted full custody. Mike wanted the home. Mike wanted to not work and have Renee work and be at the provider. So that obviously piqued my interest. Could either of these men have possibly wanted Renee dead? Detectives know they have to hit the ground running right away. We have to find out who all these people are and go and start to question them to try to find out where they were on the night of the murder. Coming up, investigators uncover an ominous obsession. There was a lot of writings about his hatred for Renee. Alarming secrets. The ceiling had a hidden compartment. Renee told me how betrayed she felt. She was extremely upset. She was very hurt by this. And the truth blindsides everyone. We've never had a, a break like this. It was, you're not going to believe this. Just disbelief. I'm still reeling from that one. Detectives in a small Michigan town are investigating the vicious murder of 41-year-old mother of three, Renee Pagel. 
police are looking into two possible suspects, her tenant and her estranged husband. They first turn their attention to Renee's ex, Michael Pagel. In the beginning, they seem like your average all-American couple. She did tell me that she did love him. She wanted marriage in a family, and he was the opportunity. She looked at him, I think the words were, the knight in shining armor. And speaking to friends of the family, they described Michael as a fantastic dad, that he was always about his children. Nobody said anything bad about him. Married life seemed like a dream come true until cracks started to appear. When I interviewed numerous people, I was told that Mike didn't want a full-time job. Mike wanted to be at home with the kids and let Renee do everything and support him. They were just having a lot of issues back and forth with one another. In early 2005, Mike abruptly surprised Renee with divorce papers. She was very shocked and just sickened to the core. There had been some turmoil in the past between them, but in her mind, things were actually getting better. They were kind of turning around, so she was blindsided by it. She said to me, he expected, I mean expected, the house, the kids, and $2,000 a month. In June 2006, just seven weeks before she was murdered, Renee and Michael had their day in divorce court. When the judge ruled in her favor and said that she got the kids, she got the house, and he was going to have to get a better paying job, something flipped in him. Was Michael so angered by the ruling that he killed Renee in a furious rage? There were a lot of things that put him at the top of our list as a potential suspect that had killed Renee. Detectives go to question Michael. When we arrived at Mike's house, he was not there. His mother said that he should be back shortly. And I said, I just want to get an idea of what were you guys doing last night? And she said, well, Mike had the kids. They were having a fortnight in the living room where Mike had set up some pillows and some blankets. Then she stated about eight in the morning, she and Michael had a brief conversation and then they went about their day. So basically she was giving him an alibi that he was home all night with the kids. As police finish the interview with his mother, Michael arrives. I explained to him that something had happened to Renee and we would like to speak to you about this. When Michael was told that she had passed away, there was no reaction out of him. And immediately, without me even going any further, Michael reached into his wallet and gave me an attorney card and said, yeah, I've been told not to talk to the police. Here's my attorney. So I thought that was extremely odd that Michael didn't want to dig further into what happened to uh, Renee. After consulting with his divorce attorney, he told investigators he wouldn't answer any questions. Michael's reticence to cooperate is a red flag. And on August 6th, the day after Renee's murder, police arrive at his home with a search warrant. We are looking for any type of knife that may have been used during the murder. We took a lot of knives from the house, but we found no knives that matched the length and the size and, and the different characteristics of the knife that was used. Police also collect hair samples and fingerprints from Michael. We wanted to get photos of his body to make sure that there was no cuts or anything on him. We wanted to look at clothing to see if there was any blood, trace evidence anywhere. All the forensic evidence that we collected, we never found anything that was useful in our investigation. All the knives in his home were examined and there was nothing to link them to this crime. We had no murder weapon. We had no real evidence. There was nothing. It was clean. So when we left that search warrant, I would say we really came out empty-handed. We didn't have anything to tie this murder to Mike Pagel. Despite his potential motive, Michael Pagel drops off detectives' list of suspects, while news of Renee's violent death quickly spreads across town. Her friend called me. 
and said, Chris Renee's dead. It was surreal. I remember curling up in a fetal position and just screaming. I screamed. I was angry. As her friends and loved ones struggle with her death, Renee's autopsy report comes in. The cause of death was blunt force trauma, homicide. It was a large, heavy-duty knife that was used on her. The autopsy revealed upwards of 50 stab wounds. There were numerous lacerations to the hands and the feet, suggesting defensive wounds. She was stabbed over 50 times. I'm still reeling from that one. It was so brutal. Detectives continue their investigation and now focus their attention on Renee's tenant, Mike Decker. She had this barn that had an upstairs apartment, and he was a renter. The barn was about 75 yards away from the main home. He could have been involved. He could have been a witness. He could have overheard something. One of her friends believed that the week of uh, her surgery, Renee was going to have pizza with Mike Decker and that she felt that there was some type of maybe a relationship going on. So that sparked our interest. I mean, if he's having a relationship with Renee, did something happen to cause him to get upset and potentially do this horrific crime? We had to find him immediately. Two days into the investigation of Renee Pagel's murder, detectives have a possible suspect. Her tenant, Mike Decker, who's rumored to be romantically involved with Renee. Detectives interview Mike at his apartment on Renee's property. At first, I kind of thought loner, 30-year-old gentleman, unemployed, living above a barn. I thought that was kind of odd. When we were speaking to Mr. Decker, we asked him if he's having a relationship with Renee, romantic or whatnot. Mike said that the relationship is more of a friendship or a kindness thing, no romantic involvement. He denied having any dinner with Renee over the past week. He stated that it was actually a month or two before he suggested that they go out for pizza just as friends, but Renee had turned that down because she was busy. Police ask Mike Decker where he was on the night of the murder. He stated that he went into a local city to eat by himself, drove back probably between eight or nine. When he arrived at home, he watches a little bit of TV and then goes to bed between one and two in the morning. Detectives ask him if he heard anything that night, especially after what they had found at the crime scene. We did locate a tire track and a footwear impression in Renee's driveway. He denied hearing anything from Renee's house. Mike tells police he didn't notice anything unusual the next morning either. He woke up in the morning around 9 or 10 and then went to meet with his family to go see a bike race. Part of the problem with Mike Decker's alibi, even though he was cooperative through this process, he was on the property when this murder happened. With no one to corroborate his alibi, police get a warrant to search Mike's apartment. We seized his pipe from his sink because we wanted to see if there was any blood or trace evidence in there, and then we found a couple of large knives. The evidence is rushed to the crime lab for analysis. The knives and the pipe forensically did not show anything. There were no signs of blood. We found no knives that matched the type of knife that was used. But still, Mike cannot be ruled out. A week after the homicide, detectives interview him again, this time at the sheriff's office. He showed no issues of concern of us looking at him as a potential suspect from gathering any type of physical evidence from him. We even offered him a polygraph. 
And Mr. Decker submitted to that also and, and passed without any uh, deceit. With nothing tying Mike Decker to the crime, investigators let him go. Searching for any further clues about Renee, detectives reach out to her parents once again, and in turn, get a lead on a new suspect, Renee's own sister, Michelle. Renee's father stated that the relationship between Renee and Michelle was strained. He mentioned that Michelle was jealous of Renee's life, of what she had. She wanted a successful career, a family, a home, all of those things. Renee and Michelle's problems went beyond sibling rivalry. During the divorce, Renee's attorney was able to subpoena the phone records of Michael Pagel. So he turned those over to Renee. When she examined phone records, she learned that Mike and Michelle were talking frequently. So she was extremely upset. She was very hurt by this. There was such significant communication between Mike Pagel and the sister, Michelle, that it raised a red flag to us right away that there might be some sort of affair going on. Renee told me how betrayed she felt by her sister. She really struggled with that. During the interviews with numerous people, it was mentioned that Michelle potentially was having a relationship with Michael. Once I learned that, it's obviously somebody we wanted to look at. Michelle is brought in for an interview. And though she says that she is saddened by her sister's death, her answers raise eyebrows with investigators. She didn't speak very highly of Renee. She was not happy at all the way that uh, Renee was handling the divorce. Michelle clearly took Mike's side in it and kind of put her sister in the bad light. She felt that Mike was a good father, and it was her sister that was really trying to take advantage of him. We did ask her if she was in a relationship or had a relationship with Michael, and she completely denied it. Detectives asked Michelle where she was the night of the murder. She said she was working into the evening, and that evening she was home with her roommate. Basically, she was stating that she was home the evening of the murder. Michelle did take a polygraph and she was found to be truthful and did not appear to have any involvement in the homicide. With Michelle all but ruled out, investigators discover that she isn't the only family member Renee had issues with. When I spoke with Renee's parents, it was mentioned that Michael, her soon-to-be ex-husband, had a brother. The brother was Charles Pago. They called him Bo. And they said that he was very strange, very odd. He and Renee did not get along. Renee didn't like him. She didn't trust him. When detectives dig deeper, they uncover something troubling. We learned from a close friend of Renee that he had been married numerous times, and she believed that maybe Bo had murdered his last wife. Was Bo a killer? And had he now killed again? That obviously raised some red flags for us as investigators, and that's somebody we wanted to speak with very quickly. Detectives investigating the vicious stabbing of Renee Pagel are looking at her estranged husband's brother, Bo Pagel. Bo was married three times in the past, and one of his ex-wives died under suspicious circumstances. One of Renee's friends gives a statement to police, claiming that she believed Bo may have killed his ex-wife. Obviously, what really sent us his way was the potential murder of his last wife, so that had our attention. Detectives must determine if Bo could actually be a killer. They look deeper into his background. Bo was a loner, lived at home with his mom. We learned that he was an on-the-road trucker, and he traveled all over the country. He would be gone days at a time. Investigators also look closer at Bo and Renee's fractured relationship. There was clearly bad blood between him and Renee, dating back years, going back to the wedding. We found out that Bo refused to be in the wedding. He was going to be the best man. He did not like her. 
thought she was not good for Mike, and he didn't approve of it whatsoever. He was outspoken to Michael about even marrying Renee, and I think the relationship between Bo and Mike was really more of an estranged relationship for the 10 years that Mike and Renee were married. But after Renee and Michael's separation, everything changed. I do know that once Mike filed for divorce, he and Bo rekindled that relationship and became pretty close. Bo was, I believe, happy that Renee was now out of the picture and he could have his brother back. Could Bo have wanted Renee permanently out of Michael's life? Detectives bring him in for questioning. So he interviewed Bo, and he denied any knowledge of the murder, denied any involvement. Bo had said that through the week he was on the road trucking. He got home Thursday night. Bo's alibi was that he was essentially across the state. He had driven a route the day of the homicide. He had gotten back around 6 o'clock and had gone out with some friends for dinner. And then afterwards, he stated he went home, spoke to his daughter, and then went to bed. And then the next morning got up and went canoeing with his daughter. We contacted his work. We spoke to the family that he actually uh, had dinner with uh, that Friday evening to account for uh, they were with him, what restaurant, until what time. It pretty much matched up. Though most of his story checks out, no one can confirm that Bo was at home at the time of Renee's murder. Needing more information, detectives reach out to Bo's daughter. We confirmed with her that they went on the canoe trip in the morning. Bo's daughter also puts to rest any suspicion that Bo was responsible for her mother's death. She gave us details about her mother that we didn't know. She was a diabetic, she had some blood sugar problems, and she really didn't care for going to the doctor. So she didn't seek the medical help that she needed, and that ultimately is what resulted in her death. She did not suspect Bo of doing anything. Though Bo's alibi isn't ironclad, there is nothing concrete to link him to Renee's murder, and he is released. It's been six weeks since the homicide, and the investigation has ground to a halt. The reason that we were stuck is because there was no physical evidence that would help tie any one person to this crime. We looked at every person, the strange husband, his brother, Bo, Renee's sister, and Renee's tenant. And there was nothing to link them to this crime. Police continue investigating for many months. But with no fresh leads, the case goes cold. It just stalled. There was a point where I felt that we would never have a conclusion in this case. It was just sad that, that we couldn't bring closure to Renee into her family. As the months went by, I was just like, what is going on? Once the months turns into years, that was uh, disheartening. For 13 years, there are no new developments in the case. But through it all, Renee's best friend never gives up hope. We created a website in the year 2007, and it was a really therapeutic way for people to come and grieve and share stories. And that website was very effective in getting the word out about Renee's murder, doing whatever it took to find justice for Renee. In a stunning turn of events, on a which was a complete shock to Bo. And it immediately made Bo angry. He said, I believed you for all these years. We've supported you. And come to find out, you're the one responsible. I can't believe you would have done that. And I think this, this made Mike angry. He expected Bo to congratulate him. So the way Bo described it was out of frustration. Mike took the knife and threw it into the river. Bo described it as a, about a 12-inch long, bigger knife. And... It appeared to be a very strong, sturdy knife. Investigators get Bo 
to show them exactly where Michael had thrown the knife. There was quite a bit of old metal, various pieces of cars and other things inside the river. And in my opinion, that wasn't a safe diving environment. We had to find another means to search the bottom of the river. Police wonder if they will be able to recover a knife that has been in the water for nine years. Then, one of the detectives comes up with an idea. It's called a rare earth magnet. The magnet is something that I've had at home, and it just came to mind as an option for a way to search the watery area and to grab whatever metal pieces were on the bottom of the river. It was tremendously impressive for him to come up with his own homemade magnet device. And, you know, he concocted his own fishing line and pulling it through the stream, which is remarkable. Police spent three days painstakingly dragging the riverbed with no success. So we were on our last few passes of the river, and I began pulling toward my side. And then it was, you're not going to believe this, just disbelief. The knife was stuck to the magnet, and it was exactly as Bo described. It was late in the day, I want to say 3 or 4 o'clock, and he got the phone call. He got the knife. I'm like, no, are you kidding me? He got the knife, no. And this is the magnet and the knife exactly as we found it. It was awesome. It was everything you could hope for when you're investigating a case to get that piece of evidence that you know you need, that you really weren't sure if it was going to be there, but there it is. Police now need to confirm if the knife found matches the knife used in Renee Pagel's murder. We brought it down to the medical examiner's office. They viewed it and instantly said, absolutely. It's consistent with the injuries that are on Ray's body. We were very confident we had the murder weapon. Unbelievable. We've never had a, a break like this. We got the needle in the haystack by finding the knife, and now we had a murder weapon that backed up what a witness said. It allowed us to validate Bo's statement that that knife was thrown in that water by Mike Pagel. On February 6, 2020, 13 years after Renee's death, Michael Pagel is officially charged with her murder. So this case is going to hinge a lot on the testimony of Bo, but it's still circumstantial evidence. And is the jury going to believe him or not? In the midst of that, the defense attorneys asked if we would consider a plea offer. When someone asks for a plea, it usually means that they're willing to tell the truth. And in this case, that was one of the conditions, is we wanted to hear the truth as part of the plea agreement. The prosecution agrees to a plea deal of second degree murder and a minimum of 25 years in prison. We wanted to get a term of years to make sure he was old enough that he would never harm anyone again. On May 20th, 2020, 55 year old Michael Pagel agrees to plead guilty to second degree murder avoiding a trial by jury. But at his plea hearing, Michael suddenly turns the case on its head. It was unbelievable. And I just remember being sick to my stomach. After 13 years of investigating the heinous murder of Renee Pagel, her estranged husband is finally being charged for the brutal crime. But at his plea hearing, Michael makes an admission that takes everyone by surprise. I hired my brother, Charles Pagel, to tell Renee Pagel. Charles Pagel murdered Renee Pagel. We were all absolutely shocked when he said that his brother did this. Mike maintained the fact that Bo was the one responsible. He admitted that he had orchestrated it and that he had planned it, but insisted that Bo was the one that actually did the stabbing, which was a complete shock to us. 
We had investigated and we found no evidence, nothing to directly tie Bo Pagel to this murder. Had Bo been hiding his involvement all along? While detectives take another look at him, they also dig for more evidence against Michael. And after several searches of his home, they make a surprising discovery. At Mike's house, we found the ceiling had a hidden compartment. When we took this down, we found three hard drives in this hidden compartment. Investigators spend time decoding the contents of Michael's hard drives, and what they find is chilling. In those hard drives, there was journaling. I would call it strange. It appeared to be written by almost two different personalities, one that would talk back and forth to the other. He talked about planning to divorce, how much he hated her. There was a lot of writings about his dislike and his hatred for Renee. Then, weeks later, police tracked down a crucial witness. We uncovered a friend who had said that he had gifted a knife to Michael that was substantially similar to the one that was actually found. And he admitted that he gave it to Mike as a gift, and it was delivered directly to Mike Pagel. So that helped us put the knife in Mike's hands. So now you have a knife that was found in the river that now a friend is saying had given to Michael and not to Bo. While the evidence is circumstantial, police believe it strengthens their case even further against Michael. There is nothing that could back up Michael's story in terms of physical evidence, any other witnesses, anything else other than his word about it. Whereas Bo at least had stuff to back it up. His alibi backed up and the physical evidence that he provided backed it up. So there's just absolutely nothing that shows that Bo did this. This was Michael Pagel. This was all him that committed this murder that night. Investigators conclude what likely happened on the night of Renee's murder. When the children were sleeping, he snuck out of his house and he went over to Renee's. It's pretty well known that she donated a kidney. Obviously, she wasn't strong at this point. She was asleep in bed, and he walked in with that knife and brutally stabbed her. I believe that Mike no doubt planned this out. There's no way you leave a crime scene that clean and it's not carefully planned. How he absolutely didn't leave a blood drop, a fingerprint, a mark, any physical evidence. Mo tells us about Mike commenting that he had worn coveralls and galoshes. So he had taken precaution to not get his clothes bloody and that he had removed those items and then put them in a garbage bag and left. And that the clothes were later burned. He's not a stupid man. He knew enough to cover his tracks. He went in there purposely. He had an intent, he had a purpose, and he went in there to kill her, and he did. There was anger involved in this crime. This was evil. But why would Michael kill Renee? I believe Mike Pagel was very upset with the way the divorce was proceeding that he didn't get sole custody of the children, that he didn't get the family home. Things just weren't going his way. He's got motive, and if anybody's got rage, it's the about-to-be ex-husband who's not getting what he wanted. I think that the writing was on the wall for him that this was the end. On October 5th, 2020, Michael Pagel is sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison. I never thought it would take 14 years to uh, bring justice to Renee and to her family. But, you know, you always had in the back of your mind that justice would be served. It was incredible exhilaration. And I do believe that the information that I provided and the passion that I poured into this did help. 
Renee's loved ones will always be inspired by her memory. The friendship that we had was deep. It was eternal. She brought so much beauty to this world. She was just a bright light shining. Oh, I miss her. A wealthy commodities trader with the world at his feet. My brother was a fun-loving guy. He had anything he wanted. He had a lot of money. The Cadillacs and the Rolex watches. Is viciously gunned down. And they shot him again and again and again. With his wife and kids in the home at the time of the attack. It was a very traumatic event to the family with people with guns threatening them. You can't dismiss the fact that it was a home invasion, but a lot of it didn't add up. I had no idea at all how this could have happened. Police chased down a number of suspects. There was a complete falling out between them. Someone could get killed over a debt that they didn't pay. A sudden disappearance leaves everyone on edge. There was a traitor. He disappeared off the face of the earth. It was suspected there was foul play involved. Uh, one dead and one missing um, put a different spin on this type of investigation. Every lead brings investigators to a dead end. It's very frustrating to have a case that hits a brick wall. Until 30 years later. They were holding a very big secret inside. When the shocking truth is revealed. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. That's not even human. That's, that's the devil. Just 30 minutes outside of Chicago lies Inverness, Illinois. Inverness is one of the wealthiest suburbs of Chicago. It's a safe, beautiful neighborhood. Some would call it very rich, very large homes, and very few crimes are ever committed in that area. But on April 30th, 1979, at 3.20 p.m., police receive a distressing call from a 15-year-old girl named Becky Gamari. Her words were, there's been a robbery, my dad's been shot, she was bleeding from the chest. The police responded immediately. As we entered through the front door, we were met by Becky Gamari. She was crying and pointing downstairs. I went downstairs and I saw a male who was leaning back in the sofa who appeared to have numerous gunshot wounds. There was a woman who was kneeling at the feet of the victim, crying almost in hysterics. The woman identifies herself as Jackie Gamari. She says the victim is her husband, Carl, and that she and her three youngest children, Bobby, Carly, and Nick, were in the home when the intruders stormed in. Those children must have been terrified and felt so helpless. It's horrifying. The family were taken out to the squad car so that they were secure and, and away from everyone. Investigators set to work processing the crime scene, starting with the body. I went over to the victim. I didn't find a pulse. There was a number of uh, bullet holes in his chest with the blood basically draining down to his pants. I noticed a 9mm gun, and there were a number of 9mm casings that were strewn about the victim's feet. There was also a small 380 caliber handgun. It appeared that a 9mm was placed to make some type of a statement. This could be a staged killing. The victim, his legs were crossed at his ankles. It didn't appear to be a natural position. I went and took uh, an inventory of what the rest of the house looked like. The bedrooms, the dresser drawers had been opened. Uh, a number of items appeared to be tossed on the floor. I could see that there were jewelry boxes that still had jewelry in them, which raises questions as to why they actually came to that residence. Was this a legitimate robbery? Was this staged to cover something up? You can't dismiss the fact it was a home invasion, but a lot of it didn't add up. It did bring into question that they were there, really, to kill the victim. We took a number of fingerprint lifts 
from the kitchen, the dining room, and the bedroom area. One of the officers noticed them. There was no forced entry. Nobody kicked in the door or pried it. As police continue working the scene, Carl's family receives the tragic news. My sister called me and says, you better get home, Carl was shot. It's the whole neighborhood where the where house was all cordoned off. We were told by the police that he's in the house, he's dead, and uh, they're investigating. So we were all, like, stunned. When this happened, it was just a huge, huge shock, and we didn't know how to react. Disbelief and just, um, can't be. Carl Gamari was born in Elmwood Park, Illinois, in 1944. He was the third of four children. My brother Carl was uh, a fun-loving guy. You know, he, um, he liked to go out and have fun, you know, go on dates with girls and um, go to parties and things like that. When Carl was in high school, he met the love of his life. Uh, when he started dating Jackie, he was like 18, and I think she was 17 at the time. He just knew that this was the one, and, you know, he wanted to get married, and he wanted to get married now. Still teenagers, Carl and Jackie started a family right away. Carl was excited to be a dad. They had four kids. Becky was the oldest. Bobby was the second oldest. Carly was the third daughter. And then Nick was the youngest. He was his son. By 1977, Carl had the perfect family and the perfect job, working in finance at the Chicago Board of Trade. Carl climbed up the ladder. And he was energetic, and he loved it, and it fit his personality to a T. He had anything he wanted. He had a lot of money. Uh, he came to Cadillacs, Rolex watches, and things like that. Uh, he started living a high life. From the outside, Carl's life seemed picture perfect. But now, his violent death leaves his family shattered. He's been shot, and I was shocked. You know, no one knew anything, what's, what's going on. I had no idea at all what, how this could have happened. Investigators start by interviewing Carl's family, who were also witnesses to the crime. I took Jackie and the two girls out to the garage so I could get a general statement from them as to what occurred. Jackie was crying and very upset. Becky was crying. Bobby was crying. This was the most traumatic thing children could go through. They said Carl went to work. Jackie was at home with uh, Bobby, her 13-year-old daughter, 5-year-old Carly, and 2-year-old Nick. Around 12 or 12.30, Bobby is laying on the couch, and she's watching TV, and two men come in, and they have guns. She said the two men were wearing stocking masks and dark clothing, and they had come in through the unlocked back door. And they point the guns at her, and they ask her, where's your mother? So Bobby leads these men to the master bedroom where Jackie is on the phone. They ask Jackie for her money, and she says, I only have $20. And they said, we're here for more than that. These men tie Bobby's hands behind her back, and then they tie up Jackie. They force them into the master bedroom closet with Carly, with baby Nick. Time is passing. Bobby said that she heard a man yelling no, who she thought was her father, and she heard three banging sounds, which she believed were gunshots. Becky came home approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon from school. Uh, she walked in through the front door, called for her mom. All she heard was uh, crying from the master bedroom. Uh, at that time, she found them banging on the closet door to be let out. Once Becky opens up the closet doors, Bobby went directly down to the basement. And Bobby saw her father's bloody, bullet-ridden body laying on that couch. It is difficult to imagine how terrifying this must have been. While the family lived through an extremely traumatic ordeal, police are hopeful that with their help, they can catch Carl's killers. Jackie and Bobby said that the suspects had actually pulled up their mask, so they had their face exposed to them. Jackie described the first suspect as a male white, mid to late 20s to 30s, uh, tall, dark-haired, 
and also had a mustache. The second suspect was shorter than the first, slightly heavier, was a white male, but had a pale complexion and facial hair. Bobby and Jackie were able to do composites of the faces they saw. I think there was a lot of hope somebody's going to recognize these individuals. When we heard about the sketch, we thought that would be it. They'd, they'd be able to find them. I was hoping to get the information out as quickly as possible with the suspect's description so that if someone was possibly stopped or seen within the general area, a patrol vehicle could have stopped them. In Inverness, where crime is virtually non-existent, police believe there is more to this case than meets the eye. It appeared to be a staged crime. It could be someone who owed money to someone and being shot for that, a jealous boyfriend. Uh, it, it could be a number of different things. You can't close your mind to any possibility at that point in time. Coming up, investigators uncover sordid secrets. He might have had some associates who might have been involved with the mob. It definitely raised a red flag. The killers evade detectives until an unexpected witness steps forward. You told me how it was going to be done, how they were going to kill Carl. To reveal a dark and twisted plot no one predicted. As soon as they knew how Carl was going to be murdered, and that's exactly what happened to him. That was the missing key. Police are investigating the murder of commodities trader and father of four, Carl Gamari. His wife and young family were at home at the time of the terrifying attack. Jackie and the two girls were mostly in shock. They were completely overwhelmed by what was happening. Jackie and Bobby saw the gunman. Armed with their description, officers go door to door looking for witnesses. One of the neighbors saw two men coming from the Grimari's through her yard, and she thought one of them was carrying like a, uh, a jewel bag. After that neighbor pointed out where she saw the two men walking through her yard. The detectives went back and followed that path. They had found a uh, cigarette butt that still had ash on it by her driveway. That cigarette butt was collected by the state police crime lab, but in 1979 there was no DNA, uh, so there really wasn't much uh, of the evidence that could be collected off of that cigarette butt. More witnesses come forward to help police trace the suspect's movements. There was a woman who was in her car around the time that this incident took place. She stated that she saw a beater-type gray car parked on the side of the street. When she returned approximately 3 o'clock or so, uh, she said that she saw the vehicle oncoming towards her. She said that the driver was a white male. The second passenger in the front was a white male, but he was trying to slump down in the seat. In her words, she thought he was trying to hide himself. The neighbor who saw that vehicle coming towards her with the two men was also able to do a composite. It's similar to the one Jackie and Bobby gave police. Composites are very, very useful. You can put them in the newspaper, you can get them on the news, you can get them out to, for people, other agencies, to see if anybody could identify them as possible suspects. So after the canvas was conducted, they then did a sweep of the area between uh, the victim's house and where this car was observed to see if they could find any evidence. They also discovered uh, tire impressions and some footwear impressions that were in the mud there where the car had been parked. Back at the crime scene, investigators get an unexpected visitor. I noticed someone approached me and he pulled out his credentials as being a Chicago police officer and told his name was Sam Greco. Sam said that he was a family friend. The girls knew Sam. Uh, they felt comfortable around him. He said that he had been called by the daughter, that something had happened, so he was coming out to see what assistance he could lend. On the day of the murder, Becky made two phone calls. She did call 911. Her next call was to Sam to tell him what had taken place. Sam originally arrived up the scene about an hour after the initial call. He had advised him that he had been on the phone 
with Jackie. This was about 12.30 in the afternoon. And that during their conversation, she said somebody was there and he heard some voices in the background and then the call was disconnected. So he had offered to give them his phone record so they could try to establish a timeline of when that occurred. Based on the time of the phone call, police believe the gunman arrived at 12.30 p.m. and left by 3 that afternoon. They spent over two hours in the home, a detail that puzzles the investigators. They spent so much time in the house, which is not normal. Home invaders usually come in, take care of business, and leave. They don't sit around. Second, the amount of items that were left behind didn't indicate that this was a straight-up home invasion. My question was whether or not they knew that Carl Gamari was coming home at that point in time, and why did they kill him? Who did it and why? And why my brother? What did he do that he deserved to have his life snuffed away and taken away? We had no idea who it could be. In their search for answers, detectives turn back to Carl's wife, Jackie. Anytime you're investigating a murder within a family, you have to look at the surviving spouse. It was clear that Jackie hadn't been the one to shoot Carl. Two armed invaders came into their house and locked him in the closet. It was very traumatic to the kids and to Jackie to have all of a sudden their peaceful day broken down with people with guns and then threatening them and not letting them move around the house and not knowing what was going to happen next. They were absolutely terrified even after uh, the suspects had left. It was difficult to get them to, to concentrate on making a statement. Jackie was crying, upset. When detectives ask Jackie about her relationship with Carl, she tells them she loved him and that he was her high school sweetheart. But what she reveals about her marriage surprises investigators. Carl and Jackie had a rather unorthodox situation at times. Over the years, they both had affairs and they would bring their lovers home. When you get information like that, that's an important thing to follow up on and, and look further to see where, if that has anything to do with what occurred here. Had the couple's infidelities led to Carl's murder? You have to look at that as a possibility. It definitely raised a red flag. It was definitely shocking. Detectives investigating the cold-blooded murder of Carl Gamari have learned he and his wife, Jackie, had both been unfaithful. That's a big red flag and needs to be looked at uh, very thoroughly. Jackie tells police they had recently agreed to work on their marriage. They seemed to be getting better as you got into 1979. They were trying to work it out. They went on a romantic vacation. They were making a plan to do another big trip to Africa. Um, they were buying a new house, and they would tell friends that, yeah, things are getting back together for us. We're going to make an effort to make this work, because, especially because of the kids. A year before the murder, the couple had even decided to renew their vows. We as a family thought, wow, this is nice. This is really nice to see, you know, that they wanted to get together and they have us there witness the renewing of their vows. They were like two lovebirds. He was gleaming from ear to ear, and so was Jackie, and they seemed like a wonderful couple. While Jackie was also a victim in this crime, detectives still need to know if she'd have anything to gain financially from Carl's death. It was learned that there was only about a $30,000 life insurance policy. Carl had never signed a will, which ties it up in court, and it could be seven years before you see any of the... Uh, the financial gain from this. And so this kind of cleared Jackie of being in the spotlight of the investigation. Investigators consider whether Carl and Jackie's renewed marriage could have driven one of their former lovers to murder. When they ask Jackie who she had an affair with, her answer is surprising. Jackie and Sam Greco had an affair. She said that she had dated Sam for quite some time, but that she had broken off the relationship with Sam to recommit to her marriage with uh, Carl. Jackie had said when she became pregnant with Nick, she stopped seeing Sam. 
detectives need to know, was Sam a jealous ex? Could he have killed Carl to have Jackie to himself? Sam was interviewed once on the phone and then again in, in person. He had met Jackie at a wedding and he was doing some private investigative work and Jackie had hired him to follow Carl to see if he was having an affair. There was an indication from some Sam's investigation that Carl was having an affair. And that ultimately led to them initiating a relationship. Sam also told the investigators that he and Jackie had been lovers, but they were now just friends. Sam denied any involvement with this case. They took his phone records, fingerprinted them, and they interviewed individuals associated with Sam. He was considered a hero uh, within the Chicago Police Department. The police back then still investigated him as much as they could. The investigators ruled him out as not being involved in this. With Sam eliminated from the investigation, detectives next look at the woman with whom Carl had been having an affair. Gail Kayak was someone whom Carl had actually hired and worked with. When Gail was interviewed, her description was it was kind of two adults having some fun together. It was nothing serious. She knew it was going nowhere. She knew Carl was married. Gail tells investigators she and Carl broke things off about a year ago and that there wasn't any animosity between them. She ended up, after the relationship was over between her and Carl, had a boyfriend, got pregnant. Given the affair had been over for a year, it just made really no sense that she would be involved in this in any way. Just when detectives think they've hit another dead end, Gail gives them a stunning new lead. She says they need to speak to Carl's former friend and colleague, Ned Kaiser. Ned Kaiser was one of the closer people to Carl at the Board of Trade. They had worked together there for a while. They socialized. Gail claims Ned not only knew about her affair with Carl, but told Jackie about it. Carl and Ned were friends. Carl would use his apartment to be with his girlfriend. Um, Ned ultimately got upset with Carl, told Jackie that Carl was using his place to be with his girlfriend. Once Carl found out that uh, Ned was the one who told Jackie about Gail, that soured the relationship. Gail also tells police Ned had a dark reputation. She had rumored that he had ties to organized crime. Whenever you're dealing with people with money and investment and all, there's always a possibility that someone um, could get killed over a debt that they didn't pay. Had Carl and Ned fallen out over money? Had Ned put out a hit on his former friend? You always look at the big picture. Business dealings with Ned, him betraying Carl to Jackie about using his place. Uh, Ned having some possible mob connections. I think you got to look at everything. You have to see what's there. Where does that lead you? Is this a person who has a reason to kill Carl? Police are following a tip that the murder of successful trader Carl Gamari may have been a targeted hit, one organized by his former friend and co-worker, Ned Kaiser. Ned Kaiser might have been, quote-unquote, involved with the mob. During the 1970s, Chicago was, was very much involved with the criminal network of the mob, and uh, a number of people wound up dead every year. Organized crime had a hand in gambling. From information obtained from co-workers and people that knew Carl, he gambled at the Board of Trade, he would gamble outside. Well, if individuals are gambling like that, then chances are they would cross paths with organized crime people. Five days after the homicide, Ned is brought in for an interview. Police ask about his friendship and working relationship with Carl. 
The relationship with Ned and Kaiser and, and Carl and, and the family was, was an extensive, involved one. Um, they had known each other for approximately nine years, and at one point, when Ned was going through a divorce, they actually let him move into their house. Ned says that's why he had a hard time keeping Carl's affair secret. Ned had told investigators that the reason he came forward to Jackie was because he was friends with both of them, and he just felt that Jackie was being mistreated by the way Carl was acting and needed to correct it. Detectives ask Ned if Carl was indebted to him or if they had any conflict about money. Ned denied ever having any kind of a fight with Carl. Ned was asked if he had any involvement, if he knew anything about Carl's murder. And he denied having any direct knowledge. There was nothing that anyone could dig up that would say Ned was responsible for Carl's death. The investigators took a very hard look at him to see if there was any way that he could have committed this crime. And they were able to rule him out. There was no evidence connecting him to the murder of Carl Gamari. Investigators are forced to let Ned go. The police talked to everyone that they possibly could. If they talked to one person and that person mentioned other people, they went and talked to those people as well. And then it gets to a point where there's just no other leads to pursue at that time. So the police are essentially waiting for new information. Authorities once again turn to the public in an attempt to find the men who killed Carl and terrorized his family. Their composites are very critical in our ongoing investigation in identifying the shooters. I remember cutting out all the headlines and all that. Boy, something's going to be recognized with the sketch and be something's going to happen with this and come about from it. But days would go on and nothing. When the sketches were released, there wasn't a lot of uh, information that came in. Nothing substantial at all. Detectives hope that the autopsy report will provide a crucial new lead. Carl had been shot six times. The fatal wound of it penetrated his chest into his heart and, and severed the aorta. When you have multiple shots like that from two different guns, it's apparent that their intent was to kill him. And they shot him again and again and again and again, total of six times. Since the medical examiner didn't find any defense wounds on Carl, there is no physical evidence on his body to link to the perpetrators. Frustration grows when detectives get the report on the fingerprints found at the crime scene. There were no known matches of any of those latent fingerprints. They had no real suspects. Didn't seem like anybody was going to be arrested for this. With the killer still on the loose, the town of Inverness is on edge, while Carl's family lives in fear. A couple of days after the original murder, someone had put a threatening note in the mailbox. Jackie then went to the police and said she was being threatened, and that was her concern for her safety. When I found that out, I was very disturbed. I was concerned about Jackie and the kids. Somebody wanted my brother killed. Two weeks after the murder, police make a disturbing discovery. It came to the attention of the initial investigators that there was a traitor worked at the Chicago Board of Trade, had just disappeared. Um, it was suspected there was foul play involved. Detectives learn his name is Artie Jones, and he's one of Carl's business associates. Art Jones knew Carl. There may have been some money involved between the two of them. No one knew what happened to him. He left uh, for work, uh, drove into the city, and was never heard from again. Could the two cases be connected? Now put a new light, a new focus with two traders in close proximity, one dead and one missing, um, put a different spin on this type of investigation. At that point in time, when we heard the news and it was all over the papers, that we thought, wow, now that we know there's something going on at the Board of Trade. When you had Carl, who was killed uh, and being part of Board of Trade, and then you have Artie, who, who disappears, after going to work at the Board of Trade. Those don't happen often. And when Artie Jones happened, that was very concerning. It was, you know, we wanted to find out, okay, who's after Artie and who's after Carl, if there was somebody, in fact, after 
both of them. Two weeks after Carl Gamari's murder, his co-worker, Artie Jones, has vanished. Detectives are hunting for a potential connection between the two cases. Through the Highland Park investigation of, of Artie, they interviewed his wife, and she said that since the, the murder of, of, of Carl, he had become very edgy. He was very secretive about going out to meet some people for business at that time, and then never coming back. It just... Uh, heightened that concern she had about the two being related. There was just no trace of him. They ran credit checks. They did phone records. They had absolutely nothing of where this individual may have gone or why he disappeared. They located his vehicle near O'Hare Airport. No reason why it was there, no rhyme. Couldn't put him on an airplane. There was just nothing. He was gone. That investigation was rather lengthy and they never did locate him and eventually his wife had him declared dead. It's very frustrating to um, have a case that hits a brick wall. Carl's family continues to push for answers. I was persistent. I would call. I wanted to hear from the horse's mouth, from the detectives. Um, what's going on? What's the next step? What are you looking at? Months and months and months turned into a year. A year turned into two years. Then you kind of like lost faith a little bit. Carl's loved ones try to cope with the terrible realization that his killers may never be found. The investigation wasn't turning up anything. They broadcasted and showed those pictures of the two men for a long time. No one knew anything. The case is considered a cold case. 30 years later, the case is reopened. Detectives Mike Kirby and Bill Stutzman took over that investigation, gave it new life. These were people who had investigated, you know, hundreds of violent crimes in their careers. I had spent nine and a half years on a uh, homicide task force. So this was my first actual uh, cold case. We were told to look at this case from 30 years ago. Right away, you're like, 30 years? Who's even going to be alive from back then that we could talk to? But when we sat down and we compiled uh, our plan of action, people we wanted to talk to, we became extremely excited about the possibility of this being solved. As the new detectives start digging into the cold case, they are confronted with a daunting problem. Barrington Police Department had two floods in their basement where their evidence was kept. These floods basically contaminated any of the evidence ruling it unusable. Any DNA we might have was gone. That's a major blow in an investigation. Most cold cases nowadays are solved through forensic evidence. We had none of that. Then, in 2011, a stunning turn of events reignites the investigation. We get a phone call. It was uh, shocking to us. Artie Jones had been located, uh, living under an assumed name in Las Vegas, uh, part of a fraud investigation by the federal government, and uh, located him. We were extremely shocked that he was alive. Investigators fly to Nevada to interview Artie Jones about Carl's murder. Well, the first thing we wanted to know was what uh, relationship did Artie Jones have at all with, with Carl? Did they have any, any kind of business transaction? He claimed he didn't even know him. So then we focused on why did he disappear then? When we talked to Mr. Jones, he said that he was having financial problems. Um, he didn't like his job. He didn't like his life. He was unhappy with his marriage. So he just faked his disappearance. And that became very clear that he had staged all this by planting the car by the airport. The two um, had no connection. The Camaria murder and his disappearance were not related. With the Artie Jones mystery solved, detectives are again left with no leads. What we decided to do was to work this like it was a fresh case and just start from the beginning with no preconceived notions, no no thoughts on where we were going to go with it. Bill Stutzman and Mike Kirby re-interviewed everyone who had been interviewed that they could find back in 1979 and 80, and 
One of the people they interviewed was Jackie's sister, Tootsie. When police interviewed Tootsie the night of Carl's murder, she told them on the morning of April 30th, Jackie called Tootsie and told her to come over that day. And if Tootsie had come that day, I don't know if she would have been another victim. Detectives bring Jackie's sister, Tootsie, in for an interview. As they question her, she makes a jaw-dropping revelation. She said, I've been ridden with guilt throughout the years. I've seen what it did to the kids, what it did to his family. Um, I can only be truthful about this. I can only tell you what was told to me. Tootsie was having ulcers after the murder of Carl. She was holding a very big secret inside. It troubled her to keep this secret for so long. She just realized, I believe, that it was the right thing to do, and that's what she always wanted to do. And she proceeded to tell us about two months prior to the murder that Jackie had said, I don't love Carl anymore. I don't want to be with him. This is the time when Jackie and Carl were getting back together. Jackie had uh, supposedly stopped the affair with Sam Greco. Based on what we learned, that was not the truth. Her affair still continued. I mean, it was very shocking. It gives you a different light view of, of Jackie yes, as a person and, and, and the type of individual she is. What Tootsie says next leaves investigators stunned. Jackie had told her of a plan that she had with Sam. Jackie said to Tootsie, we've found a way to get rid of Carl. We're going to make it look like a home invasion. Some men are going to come in, uh, they're going to tie me up, and they're going to wait for Carl to come home and kill him. Tootsie couldn't believe what her sister was saying to her, and they just kind of ended the conversation with Tootsie saying, Jackie, you don't have to do that. Divorce him. Just divorce him. And Jackie would reply, if I divorce him, then I don't get all the money. Jackie had told her how Carl was going to be murdered, and that's exactly what happened to him. It seemed almost mind-blowing to think that uh, Jackie could be involved in such a crime as to expose her daughters and her uh, infant to their father getting killed in the home. Investigators tell Tootsie they'll need more than just her word to lay charges. They decided to ask her if she would be willing to record conversations with her sister Jackie. At first, Tootsie said no, she didn't want to do it. She didn't want to hurt Jackie. We had emphasized with her that, no, we're not saying Jackie physically killed Carl, but she was part of a plan in which Carl was killed. And we had said, we're asking you to put an open-ended statement to her and see how she responds. She agreed to do it. That was the missing key to make this case go forward. More than 30 years after the cold-blooded killing of father of four, Carl Gamari, police learn his wife Jackie plotted his murder with her former lover, Sam Greco. But investigators need hard evidence to arrest her. They convince Jackie's sister, Tootsie, to record a conversation. Hi, Jackie. How are you doing? I'm not doing good, honey. The police have been here about Carl. And uh -huh. uh, they've been asking me a lot of questions. They're saying I might have to go in front of the grand jury. I don't know if you remember what you told me. I do. Are you going to do that, though, to me? I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to. Oh, my God. They're just telling that I wish you were dead. Don't tell them I said that, please. I already, they already know, Jackie. You told me how it was going to be done, how they were going to break in and tie you up and put you in the closet and then kill Carl. You're going to help me, Jackie. I can't go to jail. you got to help me. I can't, I can't lie. I can't lie. Did you just tell them you're all confused and don't remember? But they know I remember. They know I do. But those recorded conversations are devastating. Jackie saying, can you lie for me? Um, can't you say you forget? There was truth to what Tootsie was saying. 
and, and that's why Jackie wanted to lie for her. That was very damaging evidence. Those recordings were all that were needed to have an arrest warrant issued. Police bring Jackie down to the station. We did not tell her she was under arrest, but she was not going anywhere. We had the arrest warrant. During the course of the interview, not only did we tell her, we talked to Tootsie, who told us about their conversation. We played portions for Jackie. And I told you that stuff. That's enough to put me away. What am I supposed to say when they ask me why I said that to you? What am I supposed to say? God, that I can't answer. I don't know. Maybe you didn't mean to tell me that you did. What should I do? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know, you're my sister, but you're a witness against me. Your testimony is enough to put me away. I'm going to go to jail. Confronted by her own words, Jackie tries to put the blame on her former lover, Sam. Because she wanted to be able to say, yes, okay, early on, I said, let's do this. But then I backed out. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So therefore, I'm not guilty of Carl's murder. There are so many things Jackie did that tells you what kind of a person she is. She wanted to be with Sam. She didn't want to be with Carl. After the murder, Sam and Jackie married a few months later. Several years later, Sam and Jackie were divorced. We continued a full force investigation into Sam Greco's involvement as also pursuing the two shooters. And before we could gain enough evidence uh, to charge him, um, he passed away from his medical conditions. On March 27, 2013, Jackie alone is charged with the first degree murder of her husband, Carl Gamari. Jackie was the true monster. Without Jackie, this crime never would have happened. In 2016, a jury finds Jackie guilty, but the verdict is overturned on appeal. Prosecutors offer Jackie a deal. She pleads guilty to murder and is sentenced to 22 years in prison. Justice finally, finally was served. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. She was a true sociopath. And not just for taking Carl's life, but because of what she did to her children. She chose to have her children be victims of this traumatic event just for her own selfish needs to get rid of her husband. A woman that involves her own children in a scheme, in a plan, in a plot to have their father murdered, her husband murdered. I don't know, if you ask me, that's not even human. That's, that's the devil. Four decades after the murder, police are still searching for the gunman. This remains an open and active investigation. It's never going to stop. If there's any new information, the police are going to follow up on it. No matter how long those shooters live and how much time passes, they can never stop looking over their shoulder. My brother was a good guy. He was very determined to succeed in anything he did. To see how he would have been when his children got older would have been a wonderful thing to happen, and I'm sure he would have loved it. Who knows how our lives would have been, you know. A lot of missed opportunities, a lot of, of things that um, never happened. I lost a brother and, you know, somebody to look up to and somebody to uh, experience life with, you know, the rest of the way. I miss Carl a lot. A devoted mother of four. She was just the ultimate mom. She always wanted the best for all of us. Vanishes without a trace. There was just no explanation for why she would be gone. I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. Investigators are sent down a rabbit hole of suspects. He said that the subject will never be found. My mom did not have an enemy in the world other than him. 
He disliked Patricia Kimmy. He hated Patricia Kimmy. He wished harm to come to Patricia Kimmy. And discover grisly clues. We found Patricia Kimmy's dentures. We did find blood in the back of the truck. And a money clip that was soaked in blood. Until a shocking revelation. She told investigators she knew where Patricia Kimmy was. Changes everything. We were shocked. That's one of the most evil things you can do. Horton, Kansas, a tiny farm town deep in America's heartland. Horton's a town of several hundred people. It's kind of a quiet town. Overall, there's not a lot of crime. Horton is a rural area surrounded by cornfields. Everybody knows everybody. It's just a typical Midwest small town. One fall day in 2009, turns into a nightmare when a daughter and son learn their mother, Pat Kimmy, has gone missing. That Saturday, I got a phone call from my mom's best friend. And when I answered it, she said that she was concerned about my mom because they were supposed to go on a shopping trip that day, and my mom had actually never answered her calls. I knew that was very strange. I jumped in my truck and went out there to my mom's house. Her jacket was in the kitchen. Her purse was sitting there, and her phone. Everything was there but her. Very quickly after my brother Tony arrived and said, you need to call the sheriff, this is not right. Mom, she did not go anywhere without her cell phone. It was in her pocket 24-7. So that was an immediate flag right there that something was wrong. I can't explain the fear over that because there was just no explanation for why she would be gone. Alarmed, Rita and Tony call 911. A sergeant arrives at the house at 9.45 a.m. He immediately notices troubling signs. On the front porch, there was a wooden gate that went across this staircase. And this gate had been broken in half and had been pushed off the porch. I noticed that the door was standing open, but the deadbolt lock was out. A rug in the front door foyer was messed up as well, and it appeared to me that maybe there was some type of struggle. I immediately treated it as a crime scene. Investigators head to the scene in search of clues as to what could have happened to Pat Kimmy. The house was well arranged. There was no sign of really anything inside the house that had been disturbed. There was a computer that had been left on. The investigators were able to tell from looking at the computer the time of the last keystroke. It was like 7, 7.01 the night before was the last stroke on the computer. So we believe she was on the computer when maybe there was a knock on the door. Detectives look for clues outside the home. We found Patricia Kimmy's car and car keys were at the home. Obviously, she did not leave with her own vehicle, so she must have uh, left with somebody else. We also had discovered several droplets of blood on the gravel rock portion of the driveway. After we looked at all the stuff, the door and the broken gate, the blood in the driveway, our thought process was she's been kidnapped. At that point, we still were considering a missing person. Maybe she was taken by force. Police break the hard news to the family that they believe Pat has been kidnapped or possibly even a victim of foul play. We had hope we're going to find her. But when they found the blood, it was just your heart sank. Who took her out of her home and what did they want with her? And I just leaned over and said, Rita, do you think she's coming back? And Rita got tears in her eyes and said, I don't believe she is. Born in Kansas in 1951, Pat's youth was full of joy. She was a very big farm girl at heart. She grew up on a farm. She loved animals. 
and always wanted to be a veterinarian. In her late teens, Pat fell in love. My mom met my father, Eugene Kimmy, in high school, so they started dating. Nobody loved him like she did. In 1971, Pat and Eugene got married. Eugene ran the Kimmy sawmill he had inherited while Pat was a devoted stay-at-home mom to their four kids. There wasn't anything that meant more to her than her family. She was just the ultimate mom. She always wanted the best for all of us. As the years passed, cracks started to appear in Pat and Eugene's marriage, and the relationship crumbled. Eugene was very controlling. To him, she couldn't do anything right. He didn't want her going anywhere. He wanted her to stay at home. In 2008, the couple called it quits. Following the divorce, I could see a difference in my mom. And I think there was a sigh of relief to her that she could finally live life freely instead of being under the thumb of Eugene. Now, all that is left is a trail of blood and a list of unanswered questions. As news of her disappearance spreads, the community unites in their search for Pat. We got as many people together as possible. We lined up and we started walking, looking for any signs of Pat. Pat was very well loved in the community. It was obvious from the support that the community gave us. Hundreds of people came out, 50 feet apart spread walking through the fields. It gave you chills to see something like that. While the search continues, detectives ask Pat's kids if there was anyone who might have wanted to hurt their mom. Reed and I both looked at each other and then looked back at him and I said, Eugene Kimmy is the only one we know of. My mom did not have an enemy in the world other than him. As investigators learn more about Eugene, a disturbing picture begins to emerge. He was often drunk. A lot of times he was very argumentative, and his drinking was never under control. The descriptions I received from everyone was that he drank too much, that he was just a very unpleasant person. My mom found out that Eugene had cheated on her, and that was something that truly broke her heart. All of us told her to get out. Nobody should have to put up with that. So that's when she decided enough was enough. Pat divorced Eugene a year before she went missing. Mrs. Kimmy ended up getting the property from the divorce. Pat had won a very large settlement with the alimony payments being made. There was a huge payment going out every month to the sum of about $2,300. So he was bitter about that. Eugene said it was unfair, was constantly complaining to everyone the amount of money he had to give her, and Eugene didn't think she was entitled to anything. Detectives also learned Eugene had made sinister remarks about his ex-wife. People in the community told us that he had made comments about how he wished she was dead. He was constantly saying that he wanted her gone. He had actually been telling people that he would like my mom to just disappear. Was Eugene so enraged at the divorce that he followed through on his threats? I don't think there was much question in anybody's mind of who had a motive to harm Patricia Kimmy. Coming up, investigators uncover a web of alarming secrets and lies. You could tell that the woman was filled with guilt. He lied in every interview. Why did he do this if he wasn't involved in this case? His story, it changed every time. While family descend into despair. We were all very fearful at that point. I knew it was not going to turn out good. Before the truth blindsides everyone. She was fighting for her life, kicking on that ground. 
You really couldn't make up a case like this. It's been 24 hours since Pat Kimmy has mysteriously disappeared from her home in Horton, Kansas. And the signs point to foul play. Police already have their first suspect, Pat's ex-husband, Eugene Kimmy. He was upset about the divorce settlement, and he made it very clear that he disliked Patricia Kimmy. He hated Patricia Kimmy. He wished harm to come to Patricia Kimmy. And he would tell that to anybody that would listen to him. Had Eugene finally made good on his threats? Detectives question him at the Kimmy Sawmill. Eugene Kimmy denied that he was involved with Patricia's disappearance. He says, yes, I'm upset after the divorce, but he says, I would never harm her. Evidence at the crime scene indicates Pat was abducted around 7 p.m. So investigators ask Eugene where he was during that time. He said he went to sell logs that day. He came home, he ate supper alone, and then later on he turned a movie on on TV and watched it until he fell asleep. And so he really had no one that was with him at any time during that period that could vouch for him. Unable to rule Eugene out, police obtain a warrant and search his home and sawmill, but find no evidence to tie him to Pat's disappearance. We had nothing concrete to put him anywhere near the scene. There was no evidence of anything to put Eugene at Miss Kimmy's house that night. Eugene Kimmy is put on the back burner. As the search for Pat continues, a telling discovery is made about a quarter mile from her house. One of our deputies located a camouflage baseball cap. It was just out among the weeds and it seemed out of place. It had a writing on the front that said Sailor's Insurance Company. I instructed him to photograph it and collect it as evidence. Knowing there had been heavy winds in the area overnight, investigators expand their search and find more evidence just a half mile west. They find a money clip that had some U.S. currency attached to it, and that currency was soaked in blood. We found a bag containing some rifle shells that had blood on it. There was coins on the roadway that had blood on them. All these items was collected and sent for DNA testing. And then just to the east of that, there was an area in the grass that kind of been pushed down. They noticed that the grass was matted down in an area about the size of a person which led them to believe that a person had been on the ground in that location. And then as they examined that closer, they began to find blood drops. That was when they knew we have a second crime scene. Because of the blood on the money clip, the blood on the coins, the activity in the grass that had blood on it, we knew something significant happened at that scene. I and Larry both thought, this is not good. We were hoping to find her, but uh, I just knew this is not going to have a good resolution. Police unearthed one more chilling piece of evidence down the road. Law enforcement called me telling me, we just found Patricia Kimmy's dentures. And I was asking them, well, how in the world do you know they're Patricia Kimmy's dentures? And they said, because her name is printed on the inside of them. And it clearly was her dentures. I don't think anybody doubted that there had been foul play. When we found the dentures with her name on them, we all thought that, yeah, this is probably a homicide now. The grisly discovery forces Pat's family to face a grim reality. We knew that she had been there, and that something really awful had happened to her. My heart just sunk, because I, then I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. While the roadside evidence leads back to Pat, nothing points to a killer 
until an officer sees something close by. There was a receipt found. The receipt had a date and time stamp on it. It was uh, dated November the 6th, the night of Patricia's disappearance. It was from a Walmart store in Hiawatha. We was able to go up and, and track down who the person was that done this transaction. Police bring the customer, a local teen, down to the station. We asked him what he was doing in the area, and he said he went out there with his girlfriend. They were sitting there under the stars, had a cooler, left the area, forgot to put the cooler in the vehicle. And he had returned to that location to retrieve his cooler. He was able to then describe seeing a very unique vehicle in the area that was stopped along the side of the road in the vicinity of Mrs. Kimmy's home. And that vehicle was unique because it was a red pickup truck that had dual wheels on the back. What the teen tells police next leaves them stunned. He also described that as he drove past that truck on the side of the road, he could see what he believed was a pair of legs in the deep grass, and that those legs were possibly kicking, as if someone was laying on their back in the grass and kicking their legs. We all thought that you know, someone was fighting for their life, and as close as it was to Mrs. Kimmy's house, we immediately thought, well, that was probably Pat on the ground. It was a good break, and it was something that we knew we were going to have to start focusing on and find out who was capable of kidnapping and murdering Patricia Kimmy. Investigators working the no-body homicide of mother of four, Pat Kimmy have found a witness who might have seen a roadside attack the night Pat disappeared. He was out with a girlfriend, and on the north side of the roadway, about where the items were found that had the blood on them, he saw a red dually pickup. He said that there was someone on the ground kicking. He didn't really see anything other than that, and he left the area. I think at that point he was young, he was scared of what was going on, and really I don't think he knew exactly what to do at the time. There was no reason for him to be making that story up and put himself at that location when he didn't need to. So his story was pretty believable. The gal that he was with, we talked to her. He had accounts for everything that he had done that evening. His girlfriend backed up what he said, so we had no reason to believe him of being a suspect. If that truly was Pat Kimmy in the grass, detectives know it's imperative to identify the driver of the red Dooley truck. To have a description of a red Dooley pickup was really a strong lead. A Dooley pickup truck is a pickup with dual tires on the back of it. My first thought was, we've got a potential suspect vehicle that we need to start looking for. As police search ownership records for red dually trucks, they receive the forensics report from the crime scene. The DNA on the sailor insurance hat was found to be that of a male. Investigators were able to obtain DNA off of the sweatband on the inside of that sailor ball cap. But you can't just take DNA and say, whose is this? You need a comparison. No match is found in the criminal database for the ball cap DNA, but other evidence is more conclusive. The money clip, the coins, the blood on everything found at the second crime scene, all was that of a profile that matched a female. And so we were able to get the DNA and be able to positively identify that blood as belonging to Patricia Kimmy. While the results are encouraging, detectives still don't have a body or a primary suspect. Then, a week after Pat vanished, her daughter Rita remembers something. I was just thinking about my mom and 
and pulled up her picture to look at on the computer. And there was a memory I had of her talking about a man who had worked on her house. His name was Dane. Mom had a contractor at her house, Dane Deweese, and she had some work and she had to call him back a couple times because she wasn't satisfied with it. Pat had had a contractor from Abilene, Kansas come up and do some work on her fireplace. And she had some disagreements with the contractor that something wasn't correct. So I got to thinking about that and pulled him up on the computer and he had a police record. So that was very concerning. Just thinking about the fact that he had been around her, he had access to her home. And what really raised a flag with him is when we found out he drove a red pickup. Well, we're on to something now. Could Pat and Dane have gotten into an argument about his work, causing him to violently lash out at her? Rita alerts police about Dane, and they immediately bring him in for an interview. He was very cooperative, told us that, yes, he has a red dually pickup. He told us that he had done some work for Patricia Kimmy's house. He was honest in telling us that she was not happy with some of the work. He volunteered to come back and fix those items, which he did, and had thought he had settled everything with her. He thought Pat was a very good person to work for. He said he got it corrected, and Pat was very appreciative that he got it corrected, and he said that he thought that everything was okay between him and Pat and that he would never harm Pat. Mr. DeWeese did not really have an alibi. He had nothing to back up his whereabouts for the night before. He told the investigators he was at home alone, but he didn't have anybody that could vouch for that. And he quickly became our prime suspect. He allowed us to search the truck, which we did. When investigators search Dane's truck, they make a disturbing discovery. We did find blood in the back of the truck. We were a little alarmed when we saw the blood in the back of Mr. Deweese's truck. Could it be Pat Kimmy's blood? And could this be the evidence that blows the case wide open? This looked like a very serious matter and indicated that he perhaps was the person involved. And the blood in the back of the truck really made it suspicious. It's been a week since Pat Kimmy was abducted and likely killed. Police suspect contractor Dean DeWeese is involved and have found incriminating evidence in his vehicle. In the pickup, we did find blood in the back of the truck. Mr. DeWeese volunteered that he had recently been hunting for deer and there might have been some blood and fur left in the back of the bed. We took samples from the truck of the blood to confirm his story. Detectives rushed the samples for DNA analysis. They were able to determine the blood actually was from a deer, and it was not human blood. After that, we searched down everything we could for Deweese and never could find out any information that he was even in the area of Pat Kimmy. So we had to eliminate him. It was hard to take at the time. We really thought we were onto something with the Dooley pickup, but there wasn't enough to go forward with. It was very disappointing. Right back to square one we go. With no new suspects, investigators focus on finding the owner of the red truck and the sailor insurance hat found on the side of the road. We talked to the sailor insurance company to get a list of people that would potentially have access to a sailor hat. Investigators were able to get a customer list and find a list of possibilities of a red dually pickup insured by sailor insurance. Detectives asked Pat's family if they recognize anyone on the list. They had us go down through the list and Roger Hollister's name stuck out. 
He's bought lumber at the sawmill before. They said Roger Hollister had done business with Eugene Kimmy and that Roger Hollister drove a Red Dooley pickup. Roger Hollister was reported to be somewhat of a hothead, kind of a person who got upset a lot, kind of a person who could be violent. He was not well liked, not a nice guy, and it, it was a major red flag for us. Believing Roger could be a major suspect, detectives rushed to the Hollister farm to interview him. We were able to contact Mr. Hollister at his house. He was wearing a neck brace. He was walking with a cane. We thought, he's a frail old man. There's no way he could be involved in this. Roger Hollister told investigators that he knew Eugene Kimmy. He'd taken logs over to be processed at the sawmill. But he had never been to Pat's house. He didn't know Pat. He denied any knowledge at all of the disappearance of Patricia Kimmy. Detectives ask Roger about the ball cap and the Dooley truck. Roger was very cooperative. He said that he did have a sailor insurance cat, but it got tore up by his dog. And he said, yes, I had a, a red Dooley pickup, but he told us he sold that truck to a guy by the name of Rick for $2,000 before Pat disappeared. Investigators ask Roger to account for his movements the night Pat was abducted. He said that he'd been at his home the whole night. His wife left late evening hours and drove to Kansas City to be with her daughter. And he was home alone the whole time. Even though Roger had owned both a sailor insurance hat and a dually truck, detectives don't believe he's their guy. We did have some doubt that Mr. Hollister could have been the person that done this because he had a neck brace on. He could barely walk. And they said he appears to be so physically challenged, we don't think that he would really even be capable of dragging someone out of their home and hurting them. At that point, we didn't think that Mr. Hollister could have been involved in this case. Detectives dismiss Roger Hollister as a suspect. A month has passed since anyone last saw Pat alive, and investigators are no closer to locating her killer or her body. There was a lot of pressure to find Patricia Kimmy. The investigative team wanted to find her. The family wanted to find her. The whole community wanted to find her and get justice for Patricia Kimmy. It was getting frustrating thinking that we might never find her, never get this case solved. Two months into the case, police catch a break when Pat's son Tony and nephew DJ show up to the police station with shocking new information. They told us that Roger Hollister went over to the Kimmy sawmill and he wants to talk to Eugene, but Eugene wasn't there. The employee at the sawmill, DJ Kimmy, told the investigators that Roger said to him, tell Eugene, I'm here to collect, I want my money. And DJ says, I don't have your money. I don't know what you're talking about. And Roger then said he had taken care of it in reference to my mom. And he said, well, I'm just here to recoup my money that I took care of the subject. And he also stated that the subject will never be found. It was a major break in the case. We were on to something now. Police are investigating the disappearance and homicide of 58-year-old Pat Kimmy. Now, two months into the case, they've learned from Pat's family that Roger Hollister has come looking for money, claiming he got rid of Pat. When Roger said the subject will never be found, referring to my mom like that, we were all very fearful at that point. Pat's nephew, DJ, tells police he remembers he saw Eugene and Roger talking at the Kimmy sawmill one day. We believe that maybe Eugene was drinking, did not like the situation he was in with his wife, and maybe he made a comment to Roger, said he wanted to do away with his wife. As we confirmed, 
There was numerous comments made to numerous people to that effect. He didn't like the divorce settlement, lost land, he was making alimony payments. That's a strong motive for murder. So our thought process was maybe he was drunk and maybe Eugene told Roger, I'd pay somebody to get rid of my wife. Despite having previously ruled Eugene out, police circle back and check his finances for any evidence of a payout. Law enforcement went through Eugene's bank records and there was no activity on his checking account. We saw no indication that money was actually paid out. We executed a search warrant on the sawmill of Eugene Kimmy, but we really didn't find anything that would substantiate Eugene's involvement in the case. Undeterred, detectives focus on tracking down the red dually truck Roger had once owned. Initially told us that he sold that truck to a guy by the name of Rick for $2,000. We searched a VIN number for a pickup belonging to Roger Hollister, but it was not put in the name of anybody by the name of Rick. And we found out that the truck was actually sold to a dealership in Tecumseh, Nebraska. Investigators learned that Roger bought the truck back from the dealership 12 days after Pat went missing. He lied about his truck being sold. Why did he do this if he wasn't involved in this case? When police bring Roger to the station for another interview, they cannot believe their eyes. He was not the same person as he had been. The first interview with Roger, he wore the neck brace, he walked with a cane. But now he comes through that door like there was nothing wrong with him whatsoever. We were very shocked. I don't think anything at all was wrong with Roger Hollister. I think he just was using that as a front for everything that was going on. Any time a suspect is untruthful with you, that just makes them look all the more suspicious. Roger tells police he went to the sawmill to buy lumber and denies speaking to Eugene or DJ about Pat or any money. But when pressed about the truck, his story changes. Roger said that he'd sold it to a group of Mexicans that were passing through the area. He did not know their names or anything about them. That sounded fabricated. His story, it changed every time. With suspicion growing, detectives ask Roger for a DNA sample. When the results come back, the news is conclusive. We found out that the DNA on the sailor insurance hat belongs to Roger Holster. That was a very big moment because now we know that he was at that crime scene because his DNA is found there. We knew he was involved. Detectives now have enough probable cause to serve a search warrant on Roger's farm. We took a track hoe out there, and we was able to pick things up, dig around. And what was found was parts of the truck. A lot of the stuff had been buried, and it's been burnt pretty severely. And, of course, we couldn't get DNA because of the fire. And the VIN number matched Roger Hollister's truck. It was then obvious that Roger Hollister had destroyed that truck and was attempting to conceal it. At that point, we had what we thought was a very good circumstantial case against Roger Hollister. We searched the property, but we still didn't have a body of Patricia Kimmy. Our prosecutor kept saying, we need a body. Then, a few weeks after finding the truck, investigators get some alarming news. I received a phone call from investigators who said, you're never going to believe this. Roger Hollister and Rebecca Hollister were just involved in a vehicle accident. The investigator said that the vehicle had turned in front of a semi-tanker and hit head-on. Rebecca was seriously injured to the point that she had to have surgery. Roger, who was the driver of the vehicle, didn't sustain any real serious injuries. And if the truck driver hadn't paid attention, 
there's probably a good chance they would have both been killed. Detectives rush to the hospital to speak with the Hollisters. And Roger's wife, Rebecca, tells them she believes her husband was trying to kill them both. Why is he trying to commit suicide? Why is he trying to kill Rebecca in the car? I think that the walls were closing in, and Roger knew it. Roger knew we were closing in on him. There was an arrest warrant issued for Roger Hollister for attempted murder on Rebecca. And he was charged for that. Now in custody, Roger says he wants to tell police what really happened to Pat Kimmy. He said that he was with Eugene when the kidnapping occurred. He said, yes, his truck was used in the crime, but Eugene forced him to go. He said that he just drove Eugene Kimmy and that Eugene Kimmy killed Patricia. And so is Eugene still involved somehow? We don't know for sure. Detectives bring Eugene in for another interview. He admitted that he did not like the situation he was in with his wife, but he says, I would never harm her or kill her. Eugene says, oh yeah, I may have mentioned that I would like to see her dead, but I didn't offer money to Roger to kill her. Eugene Kimmy did not deny that he'd made those remarks, but that he had said it more in anger, you know, just a person running their mouth that's upset with their ex-spouse. Detectives have no solid proof Eugene was with Roger that night or that any money ever changed hands. As a result, we were never able to tie Eugene Kimmy into the murder, never had sufficient evidence to charge Eugene Kimmy. Police release Eugene. Then, six months after Pat's disappearance, Rebecca Hollister asked to meet investigators. She was very upset. You could tell that the woman was filled with guilt. She told investigators that she knew where Patricia Kimmy was and she wanted to take them to the body. It's been six months since police believe Pat Kimmy was abducted and murdered. Now their prime suspect's wife, Rebecca Hollister, is at the station and wanting to talk. She told investigators that she knew where the body was, and she told them that the body was at their farm. We were shocked. I think she was realizing that she better come clean, and... I think she decided to do the right thing by giving us the body. Rebecca Hollister was offered immunity if she would cooperate with us and be truthful. We would grant her immunity from prosecution. Rebecca claims her husband, Roger, told her where he buried Pat Kimmy on their 40-acre farm. She took us to the property, and she says, I think she's down there, and points towards a ditch. And sure enough, exposed to everybody, was about a six to seven inch section of spine. We found a piece of the vertebrae with some ribs attached, and we found another short piece of the ribs. The body was burnt, the body was cut up, the body was crushed. I mean, he destroyed her body. And lucky enough, we found enough of the remains to identify her that we knew we had Patricia Kimmy. One of the officers told me that her body had been dismembered and burned. And that was very hard, one of the hardest days. When we recovered the body, I felt we had a very strong case. I felt we had the right man. I felt we had the evidence to convict him. On June 4th, 2010, Roger Hollister is charged with first-degree murder. At the trial, prosecutors present a picture of what they believe happened to Pat the night she was murdered. Roger went to her house, got her to open that door, and when she did, Roger pushed through, was able to grab 
Patricia, subdue her, and take her out to that truck. He got her into that truck and took off down her driveway. As he turned the corner onto the gravel road, she somehow got away from him. She jumped out of that truck, and he pursued her into that ditch. There was a confrontation. I think she put up one heck of a fight, and she was fighting for her life when she was killed, kicking on that ground. We believe that Patricia Kimmy died on the side of that road where the evidence is found. And that he then got her into that truck, returned back to his farm, and tried to burn the body, and then chopped up what was left and buried it there on the side of the creek. And then he went and tried to get his money. We were never able to recover any financial records indicating any money changing hands. But yet we knew that had to be the motive because Roger Hollister had no other reason to kill Patricia Kimmy other than hoping to being paid by Eugene Kimmy. We believed that maybe Eugene was mouthing off about paying to kill Patricia and that Roger heard that. I think that Eugene made one of those drunken comments that he would like to see his wife dead, and Roger acted alone and went out and done it. That was a very big shock. You really couldn't make up a case like this, and it really was like something written for TV, but it wasn't. It was real. To cut a body up and burn a body up, that's one of the most evil things you can do. It was very unexpected. There was a lot of twists and turns. But ultimately, we just wanted justice for Mom. On March 1st, 2011, a jury finds Roger Hollister guilty of murder. At the sentencing, Roger got life without the possibility of parole. So we knew once he was in prison, he was not coming out until it was a pine box. Two years after being convicted, Roger Hollister dies in jail from ill health. You know, I don't know if that will ever seem fair that he spent such a short time in prison. It wouldn't be enough if it was a thousand years for taking our mom's life. I think we all just hope to be half of the person that she raised us to be. Our mother was a saint on earth, the kindest woman you'd ever meet. There's no doubt in my mind she's in heaven with God above. You just miss her every day. vibrant young woman making a fresh start in life. My sister had a great sense of humor. She was just full of life and ideas and, and fun. She had a new graphic design job, a new relationship, a new place to live. She was looking to a new future. Is mercilessly slaughtered in her home. The person slit her throat. It was a shocking murder. Whomever the attacker was, was extremely disturbed. You just can't register it. She didn't have any enemies. Everyone loved her. Investigators tracked down multiple suspects. There was a creepy guy just watching her. There was a note that said, saw no signs of life. Then police discover an enemy in disguise. They were using other individuals to try to throw us off. It was a bombshell. Detectives unmask a killer no one could have imagined. And I said, what? It didn't make any sense to me. I was in complete shock. Gulfport, Florida is an idyllic community complete with sun, sand, and seaside charm. Gulfport is kind of a classic uh, southern town. It's kind of an arty community now. Gulfport has a beautiful beach. 
And people are very friendly. I never felt unsafe living there. On May 24th, 1984, Gulfport's laid-back lifestyle is shattered when a disturbing discovery is made. A woman was checking on her neighbor, and when she didn't answer the door, she viewed inside one of the windows and saw a body laying in a pool of blood. And that's when she called 911. Homicide detectives are sent to the address in Waterview Park. Entering into the, uh, the residence, I noticed broken glass, and I saw the victim's body. There was a copious amount of blood pooling around her head. She looked like she had been hit with a blunt object. There were several stab wounds up and around her neck area, like it was an attack of rage. The victim was partially clothed in a black teddy over a white t-shirt. It was kind of unusual for someone to wear a teddy on top of their t-shirt. It was done snapped at the crotch. And so I had suspicions that she was sexually assaulted. Even though the area was so gory, she had no blood on the soles of her feet. And that was important because you could see bloody footprints and it appeared to be a barefoot as well. We surmised that the perpetrator stepped in the blood after the attack was over. The scene is so bloody, it's not yet clear what exactly happened. The body is sent for autopsy while detectives continue surveying the home. There was blood on the bed blood smears on the drapes and blood on the windowsill. Possibly the attack started in the bedroom area and then uh, traversed over into the living room. The trail of blood would indicate that she was fighting throughout. I think she was able to get away from her assailant and run through the house and open the door. There was some blood and hair on the door and it looks as though she was stopped drug back in and then finished upon examination of the residents we couldn't find any type of weapon the crime scene was indicative of a very involved struggle yet there was nothing knocked over or in disarray in the house that's possible that could actually happen that way but it's also possible somebody went back in and cleaned it up police speak with the woman who found the body She tells them the victim is her neighbor, Karen Gregory. She said the victim's boyfriend, David, was at a conference in Providence, Rhode Island. David had not heard from Karen, and so he called and asked if she would check to see if Karen was okay. Born in Albany, New York in 1948, 36-year-old Karen Gregory was a loving and kind free spirit. She was the center of attraction at any gathering, and people just loved her. Karen had a great sense of humor. She was a really good artist, had a great eye. She was a smart woman, and very clever and and witty and talented. Karen loved to seek out new places and was always up for an adventure. She traveled a lot. She would go to Jamaica and explore. And I think her ultimate goal was to go to Jamaica and teach art. Before Karen can make her dream move, a chance meeting in Florida changes her plans. And then she met David. David was an interesting character uh, and probably a match for my sister's wit. He was very clever, very intelligent. David was a therapist for PTSD Vietnam vets, and they were just a really good match for each other. They were probably almost a year into the relationship where she had been visiting enough and staying there enough that it was time for her to move in with him. This was a new beginning. She had a new graphic design job, a new relationship, a new place to live, and I think she was looking to a new future. She had just moved in with David the day she was killed. Who would take away Karen's life in such a horrific manner, and why? Detectives hope clues at the scene will point them to the killer. Well, we found the Village Voice publication from Providence. 
that struck us as really strange because David was supposed to be up there at the time. That newspaper actually was dated the day that Karen could have been murdered. Was David really in Providence or had he returned? Before detectives can contact David to question him, they find another lead outside. A note was placed on the car. The context of the note itself was uh, was quite telling. It says, came by, I have something for you, but there was no sign of life. Rather brief note. But obviously, the no sign of life would, you know, send up a red flag. The note is signed by someone named Peter, but there's no other information, so police have no way to track him down. Officers collect the note as evidence, as Karen's family is notified of her death. The day I got the call was just a beautiful, warm day. This isn't the kind of day that these things happen on. They had found my sister murdered. And I said, what? It didn't make any sense to me. And my mind just went through all of these situations to make that call impossible. And everything would be okay. Police asked Karen's brother, Roy, about her relationship with David. Karen's brother indicated that there was a little conflict between Karen and David in that Karen may have had an interest in another individual. In Jamaica, she met a guy, and then she'd stay longer and longer on these trips. I think she was kind of torn maybe between both, both realities and both futures. We also found out that Karen and David had broken up for a length of time before her death. It wasn't some huge breakup, and she was still moving in, so we assumed everything was going to be worked out. But the weekend she was moving in is the weekend she was killed. The murder was at David's house, and I knew there was a rift there. So I think that added to maybe, well, you know, you just never know. Could he have flown out to Providence and rebooked a flight back to Gulfport, committed the uh, homicide, and then jumped back on a plane we have to track down David. We felt that something was there behind the scenes and we needed to find out about it. Coming up, investigators discover a series of suspicious men in Karen's circle. He had been physically abusive to his first wife. He made Karen feel very uncomfortable. And scrambled to separate friend from foe. Here we are building on a story really raising red flags for us. He's either protecting somebody or he's just flat out lying. Until finally, the awful truth is revealed. It makes me sick to my stomach. No one would have ever thought that this person murdered this woman. A day after 36-year-old Karen Gregory was brutally murdered in her home, Police in Gulfport, Florida, suspect her boyfriend, David Mackey, could have killed her, and they need to track him down. Detectives found out that David was in Albany and that he had flew there to be with the family for the wake and funeral of Karen. David Mackey seemed to be concerned about Karen, and he wanted to know what was going on. We weren't going to give David the investigative uh, information that we had he said that he wasn't going to be back in Florida for another two weeks. David promises to come down to the station when he is back in town. In the interim, investigators sent officers to canvas Karen Street. Many of the neighbors heard a scream that night. Many got up and looked outside their windows and saw nothing. They didn't know exactly where it came from. Was it kids in a car? I mean, you know, they didn't really know time of the scream uh, was around one o'clock in the morning. There's some thought the time of death was during the scream. She wasn't discovered until midday, the day after that. The head of the neighborhood watch is one of Karen's closest neighbors and a familiar face detectives can rely on. George Lewis was a Gulfport firefighter, had grown up in Gulfport. All the police officers know him. George and his wife, Linda, were very good friends with Detective Larry Tossi. Well, having somebody uh, like George uh, to depend on 
was very, very comforting in that if something was going on in the neighborhood, he just was that kind of neighborhood watch guy. George said that he was working in his garage, which was across the street from the murder scene. Uh, he said he heard a faint scream. He had the radio up loud. He even went out in the street, didn't see anything. But George did see something the day before Karen's body was found. George Lewis described seeing this guy pull up in his car and walk up to the door and then write a note and put it on the windshield of one of the cars. Did George see Peter, the man who wrote that note? He didn't know Peter Clutt was certainly something that the police wanted to look into because that was the only person they were aware of that went to the house during that time frame. The next day, as police are figuring out how to track down Peter, they catch a lucky break. In order to release the remains of the body, Karen's old roommate was asked to identify the victim. And at that time, she brought another person with her. And he identified himself. It was Peter Cumble. Investigators bring Peter in to answer some questions. I noticed the scratch on his hand, thinking, you know, maybe it was done by by Karen. He noticed me looking at it, so he moved his hand. They asked him about that, and he said that his dog did it. Peter confirms to detectives he is the one who left the note for Karen and says he was at the house around 7.30 p.m. He had been invited to dinner by Karen. They'd known each other for maybe a year. They were both reggae music fans. He was bringing back a music tape, and that's what he was referring to when he said, I have something of yours. Not having anybody respond to the knock on the door, he just left the note and left. During the interview, he didn't seem very upset. Portraying that he was such a close friend to Karen, uh, it kind of sh- struck me as being, you know, strange. Detectives ask where Peter was when Karen was murdered. Cumble's explanation for where he was that night was he was at home. He did indicate that his roommate could verify that. He answered the questions, and he was amenable to whatever I asked him to do. Peter provides police with his fingerprints and footprints. And while they let him go, detectives will keep an eye on him. We weren't eliminating Peter Cumble from the investigation. Three days after the murder, police received the medical examiner's report. Karen had dozens of stab wounds on her. And it wasn't until they had cleaned her up they realized that the person slit her throat. Karen was tortured. The time of death was a day and a half before her body was discovered. The report also confirms another disturbing fact. The autopsy determined that a rape was involved. The examiner found semen, but there wasn't enough to make comparison. And DNA at that time was in its infancy. Thinking about what she went through, it makes me sick to my stomach. You just can't register it. She didn't have any enemies. Everyone loved her. After two weeks out of state, Karen's boyfriend David returns to Florida and is immediately interviewed by detectives. David was still very upset. He said he loved her and they were getting serious with each other and that she had finally found what she was looking for in life. When detectives reveal they know he and Karen had issues, David brushes it off. He repeated it was all good. They were in love with each other. David claims the last time he saw Karen was the day he flew out of state. Karen had driven David to the airport because he had a conference to attend in uh, Providence. Skeptical, detectives tell David they can place him back at the crime scene. And I said, we found the Village Voice publication from Providence. It was dated and I had a murder here in Gulfport. He indicated to us he had purchased the Providence publication to check on the weather before he had left. He told us it was at the newsstand in Gulfport a couple of days prior to the homicide. We have to look into that. Detectives asked David point blank if he murdered his girlfriend. He became frustrated, in my opinion, that we'd be looking at him instead of spending time looking for the real killer. 
He was pretty adamant in the fact that he was off doing a conference in Providence and he hadn't gone anywhere. He said, I want to be as much of a help rather than a hindrance as I can. He was also asked to submit foot samples, which he did as well. When asked who might want to kill his girlfriend, David gives a name detectives recognize. David informed us that he felt that Peter Cumble had some kind of an interest in Karen. It became clear that David was trying to blame this on Peter Cumble. Police are investigating the grisly murder of Karen Gregory. Her boyfriend, David Mackey, denies being involved and points detectives towards Peter Cumble, a man police have already questioned and released. In David's mind, he felt that Cumble was someone who had an interest in Karen, like as a potential girlfriend. David wasn't aware of anything about Cumble being invited to dinner and really probably had no real reason to see why Cumble would come by the house while he was gone. He said that Cumble was an acquaintance, but not a close friend. They knew people in the same circles. Peter Cumble was always calling Karen up and that he felt he was going to try to develop a relationship with her and Karen obviously wouldn't have anything to do with it. David was concerned that Cumble could be involved and they needed to look at him closely. With nothing concrete to link David to the murder, they let him go. Detectives now need to confirm his claim that Peter had ulterior motives around Karen. When police try to bring Peter in for another interview, they had a problem. He had left Gulfport right after his first interview. He had went on vacation, and the detectives found that strange that him being close to Karen Gregory, that he would leave and go on vacation after her death. Without the evidence to compel Peter to return, investigators switched gears and delved deeper into David Mackey's alibi. David had told police he had given a presentation in Providence at 9 a.m. on May 23rd, which would have been eight hours after Karen was killed. Was it possible for him to have got on a flight, come down, murdered Karen, and got back up to Rhode Island? Detective Sergeant Tossi decided to take flights in the same time frame. I found that he could have committed the murder and get back in time and do his presentation. It would have been tight, but it's possible. Detectives subpoena David's credit card information, but they show no record of David buying any additional flights. David's story about the newspaper also appears to check out. It was discovered that the paper actually comes out two days early, and the gentleman remembered selling the paper to David Mackey. David was telling the truth, and his alibi was solid. As weeks pass without an arrest, Karen's friends and family become concerned. Not knowing why or who or how this even happened, you're left with all these questions. The grief was too heavy. There was just a lot of weeping for a long time. Just the slightest little, little memory of her or thought of her. I can weep right now thinking about that. For such a small town, it was a shocking murder. I can only imagine what some of the women that lived alone in that community felt when there is a killer out there and they haven't been caught. A few weeks into the investigation, detectives get a boost when potential suspect Peter Cumble arrives back in town. He looked a little bit disheveled, he looked a little bit shaky, as if he didn't want to be there type of, a, of an attitude. Detectives cut to the chase and ask Peter if he killed Karen Gregory. He was completely shocked. Cumble's alibi was he was at home. But with David pointing the finger at Peter, Detectives need to follow up. He was pretty adamant in the fact that, you know, he, he hadn't gone anywhere and the roommate could be his uh, alibi witness. Anybody can say they're home and they're in bed. In the middle of the night, they can go out and do what they want to do. And that's a very shaky and unsubstantiated alibi. We didn't have much to hold him at that point, so he left. Needing something concrete to tie Peter to the murder, Investigators hope his footprint sample matches the one found at the scene. 
there was a partial bloody footprint on the floor. We did send it off to the sheriff's office, and we waited quite a period of time, and then we heard back that they couldn't find any identifying ridges or swirls. It's a big disappointment uh, to me that uh, our sheriff's office couldn't make a match. Detectives refused to give up. The photograph of the bloody footprint looks mostly like a smear. So it was sent to Washington for the FBI to look at, which was not uncommon practice, especially if you had uh, something that might be difficult for a local person to do. The analysis won't be fast, so investigators go back through everything collected at the scene and find a potential piece of evidence. There was a schematic drawing of a clock that appeared to have a blood stain on it. Did the murderer bring that with him and leave that there, forgetting about it? Did he get blood on it while this happened? So it looked like a pretty good clue they needed to follow up on. They were able to determine that these were schematics that had been drawn by Stephen Fischler, who was someone that Karen worked with. Detectives send the blood on the drawing in for testing. And when they look into Stephen Fischler, they discover something troubling. We found out from female workers that they felt uncomfortable around him. And he showed the girls pornography and uh, they took offense. They indicated they were afraid of him. According to one friend, Stephen Fischler made Karen feel very uncomfortable many times. He made unwanted advances. At one time, he gave her a provocative novel that he was writing. Fischler, as far as the way he behaved in the office around women, he was a suspect. We decided that we needed to have an extensive interview with Stephen Fischler. Stephen Fischler had kind of a defensive attitude. He was curt. He said that they didn't really know each other. He and Karen had seen each other at work, but she had only been working there a short period of time. When Stephen was questioned about the schematic, he had no explanation for how it got into her house, other than she probably took it home with her. Detectives grill Stephen about his reputation among his coworkers. And he became angry. He said, well, I had no idea. We asked him if we'd take a polygraph test. He agreed to do that. Stephen didn't really want to answer the questions. He was extremely frustrated. Just when investigators think they won't get anything out of him, Stephen says something truly shocking. During the polygraph, he blurted out, okay, I did it. Everybody thought, well, heck, this guy is confessing. Two months after Karen Gregory is viciously slaughtered in her home, her coworker Stephen Fischler has just confessed to police. It was unexpected. Was he really telling the truth? Police immediately begin to press Stephen for details behind his confession. We determined that after talking with Stephen that he blurted out, okay, I did it, just out of frustration. He was angry because he was being accused of this murder. And it was, that was just his personality and his temperament. Stephen retracts his confession and proceeds with the polygraph. He passed the polygraph. They showed no deception indicated. The result was totally unexpected to us. It basically cleared Fischler. But Stephen's not off the suspect list just yet. He refuses to provide a footprint sample, so police must wait for the results from the schematic drawing to see if any foreign blood is detected. In this case, the blood was clearly all her blood, and it wasn't Stephen Fischler. There was a lot of frustration. It kind of hit a dead end. Running out of suspects, investigators switch up their approach and put together a behavioral analysis profile of the killer. You're trying to look at, you know, what causes people to do what they might do. It wasn't your general whodunit Whomever the attacker was, was uh, extremely disturbed. He was the type of individual that had various fantasies, sexual fantasies, which drove him to commit the murder of Karen Gregory. Maybe 
This was a serial killer, which kind of fits into that whole psychological pattern to some degree. It was probably the most difficult case that I had to, to deal with. Five months down the road from the homicide, I just couldn't let the case go. Couldn't put it on the shelf. For Karen's family, coping with the reality that her killer may never be found is overwhelming. We kind of thought like, you know, they're never going to solve this, which was just alarming to us. And that's another whole kind of pain that was a nightmare. She was a sweet, wonderful young woman. And the killer was a brute, you know, who butchered her. Finally, a break comes in December, five months after the murder, when detectives make a discovery that revitalizes the case. Tassi was talking to a person who lived a few blocks away from Karen, and that person told him they had heard the scream. She described it as just a wail, and that it was very disturbing. Tassi was like, he didn't realize it was really that loud that actually over two or three blocks people heard this. This new information is in direct conflict with the statements of the neighborhood watchhead. And she's several blocks away and she hears the scream and George is right across the street. How come he didn't hear more than what he said was a faint scream? It didn't make any sense. So we figured we better have another talk with George, which we did. Detective Tassi, he looked at George as a helper to the police case. George was a firefighter, the neighborhood watch guy that was actively out there. When we went over his story, he indicated that he had heard the scream, that he walked to the edge of his driveway, looked around and didn't see anything. Now, George adds a new detail to his account. Now, he sees somebody on the lawn under the big oak tree. The story was quite a surprise. Why didn't he report it? Why didn't he call? He didn't really know what to say. I think in many ways he was, he sounded nervous. George describes the person he saw the night of the murder. He said he was like 6'4 and had red sandy hair. It was a big, strong looking guy. It was certainly something that the police wanted to look into. Armed with the new information, detectives try to track down this mysterious man. And in doing extensive neighborhood interviews, it was related to us there may be a peeping Tom in, in the area that fit. We thought, well, we may have something to go on here. I interviewed one person, and she said that she had a peeping Tom at her window. And when she noticed him, he took off. Could the peeping Tom be the killer police have been looking for? Investigators showed George pictures of possible prowlers. He couldn't identify any of them. So the mystery man on the lawn remained unidentified. So there's some thought that he might have been watching that house and watching her and knew that she was alone that night and knew David was out of town. I felt terrified, especially at night. I kept my doors locked. I didn't want to end up like her. Detectives find another woman in the neighborhood who recently saw the prowler. There was a creepy guy just watching her for some unknown reason. She caught him peeping in the window. He took off. The woman recognized the man. When she tells police his name, they're stunned. It was a big surprise. Detectives hunting for Karen Gregory's killer learn there's a prowler stalking the women of Gulfport, Florida. Could the offender be one and the same? When a victim of the voyeur comes forward with a name, investigators are shocked. It's the neighbor, George Lewis. It was totally, totally unexpected to us. Detectives bring George in for a third time and ask him about the woman's claims. He admitted he was outside the house, and he had some explanation for why he was there. He was a neighborhood watch guy and always looking out for people. He said he heard a noise or something. 
They thought, you know, it's, it's it possible gets the killer. He was given the opportunity to take a polygraph test, which he did. Detectives start by asking about the prowler. Listening to the polygraph tape and how George Lewis described the man, I really believed him. Investigators also ask him about the night of the murder. Did you kill Karen Gregory? George said no. The polygraph results tell a different story. The results were disastrous. He failed it miserably. After he failed it, he had something else to say about the night of the murder. George admits he hasn't been completely honest and tells police that's why he didn't pass the polygraph. George Lewis indicated to us the individual that he saw on the lawn left Karen's house itself. He saw George and had approached him and threatened him. The person walks out and tells him, if you say you saw me here, I'll come back and kill you. So that's the reason he wasn't forthcoming. He was afraid of him. George Lewis went from just hearing a scream at the edge of his driveway to indicating that he saw the perpetrator. And then his next story, George said this guy threatened him. We were very concerned about that because here we are building on a story, so it really raised red flags for us. We felt that, you know, with the abundance of different issues and stories he was telling, he was using other individuals to try to throw us off. We had asked him to do a composite sketch of the individual that he saw. After the sketch was done, we both looked at each other and said, this really can't be happening. We both came to the conclusion it was George when he was younger. I think he thought the police had a witness who saw somebody in Karen's yard. So he was making this description of the person who scared him get closer and closer to looking like him. He's either protecting somebody that he knows which is flat out lying. We have to look at George a little closer. Investigators collect his foot and fingerprints, but with little hard evidence to hold him, George is released. Detectives take a deep dive into George's past and make some disturbing discoveries. He had been physically abusive to his first wife. According to her, there were times when he had been violent with her. He had choked her. The crime itself shows some pretty deep-seated violence towards women, and I think there was aspects in, in his background where you could see that. George had gotten into a swingers club. That was a part of George I never really saw, you know, or never knew. He's never said anything like that to me. So that was kind of surprising, but things were building up with him and, and his behavior. It appears George developed a troubling fascination with Karen before she had even moved in. One of uh, George's uh, friends told me that uh, Karen was visiting over at David's house. Karen had come out in a bikini, and he made some comment about liking to have an orgy with her. Got aroused. He had gotten into sexual perversions, if you will. I think there was indications that he was, you know, a peeper of some sort. Still looking for hard proof, detectives ask George's wife about the night of the murder. She was awoke, awoken by the scream. After just a few minutes, George came in from the garage. The killer would have been covered in blood, but George wasn't. When you sit back and you look at you th these things, because you say to yourself, oh, well, maybe he really didn't do it. Maybe his story makes sense. Or maybe he's covering up for somebody that did do it. You know what I mean? And so now it's, you know, where do we go from here? At that time, we didn't have, you know, DNA. The only thing that could tie itself into the case was the footprints. Detectives are still waiting for those results. It was getting extremely, extremely frustrating for the team. And then the, the months just went by, you know, nothing, nothing happened.
it seemed like it was just going to be a cold case. And it's like, well, what are we supposed to do with that? You know, you can't just stop here. But they didn't have leads. They didn't know where to go with it. This is about my sister being butchered to death. We were not going to rest till they found who the killer was. In March 1986, almost two years after Karen's murder, the FBI finally finished their analysis on the bloody footprint at the crime scene. The day that the data came back from the FBI, everybody was elated. It showed the ridges on the heel from the bare foot, and they can be identified, compare one to someone else. Detectives have renewed hope the killer is within their reach. We must have sent 20 sets of footprints. Then they got a result on that relatively quick, which changed the whole case. A definite match. No one in Gulfport would have ever thought that this person murdered this woman. Nearly two years since the brutal slaying of Karen Gregory, detectives have just received a report back on the bloody footprint found at the crime scene. The footprint was sent to the FBI. We were waiting specifically on just that result. There was a definite match of a footprint of George Lewis to the inked footprint that we had sent up there to the FBI lab. It was shocking. It was very hard for me to believe that George Lewis murdered Karen Gregory. He was the head of the crime watch. He was a firefighter. I was in complete shock. Although no one could believe George was a cold-blooded killer, the evidence doesn't lie. Footprints with their ridges and their swirls are similar to fingerprints. If you have enough of those patterns to present to a match, then they're just as good. I didn't want to believe it. And I had to face that, the trusted George. He was toying with me. He certainly wasn't the person that I thought he was. The detective knows he has to ask his old friend some tough questions. We asked him to come into the station. And that's when we confronted him with the foot friend. That's when he said, I crawled in the window. That was a bombshell. Now here's a whole new story where he's absolutely in the house. He indicated that he had heard the scream. He had gone through the bedroom window to try to assist Karen. He said that he saw her laying there with her throat cut open. Only the killer would have known that her throat was cut. He said he had stepped in the blood to assist her or help her. And then he had exited out through the bedroom window. His explanations didn't make sense. If you assume that his story is true, that he was threatened by this person on the, in the yard and was too scared to do anything about it, then why would he go into the house? Why didn't he call police at that time? His story is BS, but the nail in the coffin, of course, was the footprint. Investigators also talked to George's wife again and they learned he would have had time to clean up after the crime. His wife had been very defensive of him. Then she changed the story. George was gone for the longest time since uh, 20 minutes or more. We don't have to prove motive. We felt we had enough probable cause then to make an arrest. I had mixed feelings. I was sorry it was George, and but yet I, I was a little upset that he just let us on. Nearly two years after Karen's brutal murder, on March 15, 1986, George is charged with first-degree murder and sexual battery. It was a huge relief that they had finally found someone, but it was a, a shock, you know, just a shock, and still no reason why would a neighbor do this. I think in looking at him, it was pretty clear that he had a... Uh, a fairly misogynistic view towards women. He thought she might be an uh, easy mark or an easy target. 
At trial, investigators put forward their theory about how the murder unfolded. George Lewis would have gone over knowing that David was out of town. He came in the house, knifed, and ready to, ready to do it, and was living out of fantasy. He, Teddy had been put on her against her will. She knew that the only way to get away was fight to get out of that residence. She was pushed and hit her head against the jealousy windows. That's when she screamed. After that, it got really violent. The rape was involved. Lewis knew then that he had only one way to go with this, and as a result, he ends up stabbing Karen 21 times. George Lewis maintains his innocence, but a jury convicts him, and he is sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. No one ever really wants to believe that someone that is there to protect and to serve could do something so horrible. This was really unexpected that he was the killer. That didn't seem like who I would expect a firefighter to be, and certainly not the neighborhood watch guy. Although maybe he was watching for opportunities. I was relieved we could actually get justice for Karen and all the people who loved her. There was a little bit of justice in knowing he was in jail. My sister probably would have forgiven him. That's the kind of person she was. It's funny sitting here now. She was alive for as many years as she's now been gone. She never lived, you know. We never got to know who she'd be as an old lady. She was just full of life and ideas and, and fun and humor. I have her ring on right now that she made for me. Karen and I were really close. And I'll always miss that. And I'll just never forget her. A gregarious young man, just months away from his wedding day. He was always happy. All he wanted in life was to have a family, work hard, and fall in love. Has his future viciously ripped away? It was evident the young man had been bludgeoned. It hurt me so much, and I lost it. I lost it. It would be Luke. Investigators are sent down a rabbit hole of suspects. He was violently jealous. He's a significant drug dealer. It looked like that he may have been kidnapped. They were accompanying a very scared-looking Hispanic young man. Before a shocking revelation. What he was describing was more like something off of a TV show. Turns the case on its head. What he did to us changed our life forever. It was a shock to all of us. It came as an absolute surprise. He had no remorse, he had no guilt. He's a monster. Cornelius, a small town in northern Oregon, nestled among picturesque orchards. Cornelius is a longtime farming community. It's a very kind of nice, sort of sleepy place. It's kind of a little bedroom community. It's mostly a blue collar town, working class. The calm of Cornelius is shaken one quiet morning with the reported disappearance of 20 year old Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. That morning, my mom saw that Gonzalo's bed was made, like no one slept there. So she obviously got all concerned. He didn't come home last night. And then my mom tells me to go to the police station with Sol to report him missing. His fiance Sol, and his sister, Juana, had been actively looking for him that day. That morning, the family contacted his place of employment. He had not shown up for work. The family was extremely distraught by this disappearance. He doesn't miss work without calling in. They couldn't reach him by pager or by telephone. And we're all freaking out because this is not who he is. 
and what he does. It's so odd. It's not normal. We learned that Saul had seen Gonzalo the night before. They had visited with each other until about quarter after nine that evening, and Saul reported seeing him leaving in his car alone, headed home. But he did not return home last night. To aid the detectives, Saul provides a description of what Gonzalo was wearing when she last saw him. He had on an athletic top with some numbers on it, and specifically uh, two gold chains. While Juana and Saul speak with police, other family members frantically look for Gonzalo. We all went different ways in our cars, driving around just to see if we found his car. We were trying to look for anything. My dad thought, you know, maybe he got in an accident. We were desperate. We just wanted a clue. Around 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we all started feeling like, okay, something's wrong now. On the outskirts of town, Gonzalo's father makes a disturbing discovery. My dad spotted the car in an empty field. When he saw the car, the white car, the, he knew right away that was Gonzalo's car. He found the car burned up. He rushed to the car, opened up the car, and didn't find any body. So once that happened, it was just nuts. Where is he at? Did he get kidnapped? Is he dead? It was even worse. Detectives arrive and search for signs of what happened to Gonzalo. The car was uh, totally destroyed by fire. It appeared that the car had been heavily doused with accelerant, probably gasoline. Somebody was clearly trying to cover up evidence from inside that vehicle. There was no evidence of any body. There were zip ties found near the car. As far as the scene was concerned, it yielded minimal clues. As the car had been burned completely, uh, the chances of DNA or blood or fingerprints uh, were greatly reduced. Later that afternoon, another chilling discovery is made. Just 11 miles away, a citizen had seen something that looked like a dead body in the ditch on her road. The body was found about a 15, 20 minute drive from where the burned car was. This young man matched both the physical description, the clothing, and the jewelry. At this point, there was no doubt that this was Gonzalo. It was clearly a homicide. Uh, there was evidence of bullet wounds on the body and what appeared to be repeated knife blows to the heart. We also discovered some injuries to the back of the head and it was evident the young man had been bludgeoned. It was apparent that he uh, died a violent death. We felt almost immediately that this was very personal in nature. There was no phone and there was no wallet at the scene, but he still had his jewelry with him, which were gold. So the thought of this being a robbery was off the table pretty quickly. There was another motive here. There were zip ties found near the body, and they matched the zip ties from the scene of the car. One of the things that went through my head was had someone brought zip ties to restrain Gonzalo? We also located four spent casings from a 40 caliber semi-automatic pistol. After finishing up at the crime scene, police are faced with the difficult task of delivering the devastating news to Gonzalo's family. The police came early in the morning. I opened the door and they told me, we found your brother, uh, but unfortunately he's dead. I was in shock. I heard my mom screaming. It was something I never want to hear again. It's, it's not even a scream. It's a pain so deep that only moms, only moms know what that is. I found out that he, he was murdered. And I lost it. I lost it. Era gritar, llora. Algo tan fuerte que todavía de mi mente no se ha acabado. 
to know that such an amazing person was taken away. He didn't deserve to die that way. Bottom line is, I don't have my brother anymore. Born in Mexico in 1979, Gonzalo had a playful spirit. He loved to dance, he loved music. Always a smile, always caring, and always joking around with people. Gonzalo era un muchacho alegre, y llegaba, me abrazaba, y, y siempre quería bailar conmigo. When the family moved to the United States in 1989, outgoing Gonzalo settled in quickly. He was very charming. He was really good looking. He was popular with the girls. So he was always asked to be in quinceañeras, which is a traditional, you know, uh, party for us Mexicans when you turn 15. In 1998, Gonzalo met Marisol Mora at a party, and the teenagers quickly fell in love. De que estaba muy enamorado de, de Marisol. Marisol era el amor de su vida de Gonzalo. Era, era todo para él. Todo. It was that genuine love and happiness. There was a light in him. He was a completely different person, a happy, full person. And all he wanted in life was to have a family, work hard, and fall in love. After a whirlwind romance, Gonzalo proposed to Marisol. So the wedding was set to be in September. That was just a couple of months after he was murdered. We have a big family, so it was going to be a big deal. But instead of a wedding, Gonzalo's loved ones are left heartbroken and grieving. While his family plans a funeral, detectives are digging into the work of this homicide case. This case was puzzling. There really didn't seem to be a strong motive as to why this young man was murdered. Everything was going good in his life. He was responsible. He wasn't involved in gangs. He's just very well-liked, very upbeat, and just a trustworthy young man. It was really difficult. There were still so many unanswered questions, and we had no definitive leads as to who would have caused this or who we were looking for. The fact that there was still a killer out there, to me, it was very ominous. This is very grim. We needed to really look into who was responsible for this. Coming up. Investigators uncover a menacing grudge. He held an extreme dislike for Gonzalo. He was determined to have Gonzalo killed. The knife wounds directed at the heart did speak of extreme animosity. And leads them to discover a web of alarming secrets and lies. She wasn't in love with Gonzalo and he wasn't in love with her. She admitted it was all a lie. He saw skinheads in the vehicle. And that's when we really started to think something was wrong. Before the truth blindsides everyone. I was like in shock. It was so senseless. It was so senseless. In the town of Cornelius, Oregon, police are investigating the vicious murder of 20-year-old Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. Wanting more details about his last known movements, detectives speak to his fiance, Saul. She described in detail how Gonzalo had come to her house on the night of the 6th, that they sat out front on the porch. They were discussing their plans for the upcoming wedding and going over a guest list. She stated that following the conversation that he left around 9 o'clock. She stated while they were sitting on the porch that her cousin Jaime and a friend Eddie were playing in the, in the garage of the house, uh, apparently uh, shooting baskets. That led us to believe that these two young fellows may have been the last known persons to see Gonzalo alive. So it was important that we interview them. Investigators bring Jaime and Eddie into the sheriff's office. During the interview, both stated that uh, they had to get to work that night and approached Gonzalo as he was getting in his car and asked if they could get a ride. They were running late for work. They worked on a janitorial crew run by Saul's brother, Rafael. They had to be at work in Hillsboro at the Hawthorne Farms Fitness Center at 10 o'clock. They said Rafael picked them up and took them to work at the athletic club and that Eventually, they got off at about 4.30 in the morning. The fact that they both gave the same statement actually provided 
themselves an alibi. They did not offer any conflict that they had with Gonzalo. They indicated that they had uh, no reason to, to hurt him. To corroborate Jaime and Eddie's alibi, police speak to their boss, Saul's brother, Rafael. We interviewed him at his house. He was very cooperative, very smooth, very polite. Had his own business, a young entrepreneur. Raphael was an incredibly self-possessed 19-year-old. Uh, he had created a janitorial service. Although he was very young, had a very good contract, had his own cleaning company, and appeared to be very successful. Detectives ask him to confirm Jaime and Eddie's story. He confirmed that he had picked them up at Eddie's house and drove them to work. He confirmed their story that they had worked cleaning the health club that night. He said that he was at the athletic club until about four in the morning. So Raphael, in effect, corroborates Eddie and Jaime's version of events on the night of the 6th. So we kind of set them aside. With Jaime and Eddie alibi, investigators turned to the autopsy report, hoping to find new leads. It became very apparent just how violently he had died. The medical examiner did find three blunt force blows uh, to his skull. The autopsy also showed that he had been shot five times. And then he had also been stabbed five times, very brutally, in the area of the heart. The close cluster of the knife wounds directed at the heart did speak of extreme animosity, some violent emotion. The gunshot wounds made it appear that his Hands were up in a defensive gesture. Gonzalo was likely pleading for some measure of mercy and uh, ultimately none was to be had. The autopsy report also determines that Gonzalo's death occurred around 10 p.m. With the findings in hand, investigators now turn to Gonzalo's workplace, searching for possible suspects. We interviewed his supervisor, Gonzalo's boss described him as reliable, steady worker, punctual. As detectives dig deeper, they learn about a startling new side to Gonzalo. It appeared that he had a relationship with one of the security guards that worked there. Gonzalo's boss did tell us there may have been some possible involvement between the security guard, Bobette, and Gonzalo. So we needed to look into it. We needed to interview her. Police bring Bobette, Gonzalo's alleged girlfriend, in for questioning. She was very upset about his death. She was very emotional, very distraught about finding out that Gonzalo had been murdered, and ultimately disclosed that, in fact, uh, she had had a very intimate relationship with Gonzalo for a couple months, but she made it very clear she wasn't in love with Gonzalo, and he wasn't in love with her. Bobette described her relationship with Gonzalo as kind of a fling, it was kept secret. She understood that he was engaged to be married, but it crossed our minds that maybe Bobette's feelings were stronger than she let on. Maybe she did not want this wedding to go forward. The wedding was planned for September, only a few months away. Police asked Gonzalo's co-worker about her movements on the day of the murder. Bobette had been at several different locations that day. Uh, running errands, and she had receipts to support that. So she was ruled out as a suspect. But while Bobette's cleared of suspicion, she hands detectives a crucial tip. Bobette mentioned an ex-boyfriend named Oscar Rodriguez. She told us Oscar was quite jealous. He was extraordinarily jealous, apparently had been violently jealous in the past. About four days before the murder, Oscar had found out about her relationship with Gonzalo. He became infuriated and began accusing her of cheating on him. That could be a motive for Gonzalo's murder, so Oscar became a lead suspect. Only two days into the investigation of the vicious murder of Gonzalo Pisano Guzman, police discover he was involved with his co-worker, Bobette. Now she's pointed the finger at her jealous ex, Oscar Rodriguez. She speculated that maybe he had something to do with it. 
We looked into him. He had a criminal history. He'd been pretty extensively involved in gangs at that point in his life, and he was well known to the local police. Very much an impulsive young man that was also involved in drug activity and drug use. Bobette told us that this was a relationship she had to escape from. She personally felt threatened by his presence and his behavior. And she was very worried that perhaps he was the one that uh, took some action uh, towards Gonzalo. Investigators uncover a troubling detail about Oscar's life. It was discovered that Oscar Rodriguez's mother uh, lived right next door to uh, the victim's family. The investigation kind of perked up as far as focusing in on Oscar, given the fact that he had such access to Gonzalo. Detective suspicion grows further when they speak to Oscar himself. When Oscar Rodriguez was interviewed, he lied to us and told us he had not had any contact at all with Bobette and didn't really know anything about what was going on. When we started to confront him that this was in contradiction to the information that we had from Bobette, he became furious, started yelling at us, you don't trust me. He stated he had no claims to continue any relationship with Bobette and uh, he wanted to wash his hands of this entire investigation. Because of his nature, he just drew suspicion upon himself. He was asked if he'd take a polygraph to show that he didn't have anything to do with Gonzalo's murder. He became very volatile and immediately demanded to end the interview. Then actually stormed out of the interview. With Oscar not cooperating, detectives investigate his whereabouts during the time of the murder. During this time frame, Oscar Rodriguez was actually serving a sentence in the Restitution Center. The Restitution Center is a work release facility for low to mid-level offenders, where Oscar could get passes to go out and find work. So the question was, did Oscar have a pass at the date and time of the murder? Was it possible that he wasn't in the Restitution Center? He is on a strict timeline. He had to check in, check out. It's a secure facility. The building is locked. There are alarms on all the doors and windows. At the restitution center, there is a lockdown period at night until early in the morning. After the records were examined, it was positively concluded that he was in the restitution center at the time Gonzalo was killed. It was impossible for him to have been involved in the actual homicide and ultimately he was ruled out as a suspect. It's been a week since the murder, and the investigation is no closer to finding a suspect. Meanwhile, the family prepares to bury their beloved Gonzalo. It was really hard on everybody. My mom decided she wanted to take him to Mexico. He was buried over there, and we all stayed for a while, trying to grieve together as a family and process what had just happened to our family. My mom was just devastated. It hurt me so much to lose Gonzalo. I was grieving deeply. I was in denial. I was in my own world. And I don't even know how I got by. While the family grieves in Mexico, the community of Cornelius is feeling on edge. There wasn't a quick arrest within a, you know, a couple days or a week. This caused concern in the community because no one knew who did it. Searching for new leads, detectives turned to the public. We decided to put out a reward for information. And the idea was to get people to come forward if they knew anything and let them know that we're a little bit frustrated with where this investigation is going. We need public help. Nearly two weeks after Gonzalo's murder, police get a tip that sends the investigation in a whole new direction. We got a call from an employee of the uh, SB gas station. His name was Ryan Petty. He claimed that he had seen some graffiti written in the bathroom of the gas station. And the graffiti said, Gonzalo Guzman, 12th Street Gang, please help, call the police. And once he heard about the reward, he put Gonzalo with that name Gonzalo and recognized it must be the same victim who, uh, who had left that, that cry for help on the wall. 
Detectives rush to the gas station to interview Ryan. While interviewing him, he divulges a shocking revelation. So what called his attention to the bathroom was shortly before he saw a car pull up, a white Monte Carlo, uh, that had, in his words, skinheads in the vehicle. One of them allegedly had a swastika tattooed on his body. They were accompanying a very scared-looking Hispanic young man. He stated that it looked like that Gonzalo may have been kidnapped. That was significant in the fact that we felt this was a big break that came in the case. Nearly two weeks after Gonzalo Pisano Guzman was found brutally murdered, a gas station attendant named Ryan Petty has told police he saw Gonzalo with three suspicious men the night he was killed. He described a carload of skinheads that uh, had drove up and a young man in the back seat who appeared frightened and they escorted him into the men's restroom uh, for a short period of time. He said that ultimately out of the bathroom, the Hispanic individual came out and they hustled him back into the car and drove away. So Ryan Petty reported that uh, when he went into the bathroom after the, an individual left it, he saw written on the wall, Gonzalo Guzman helped a 12th Street gang call police. But as detectives dig into Ryan's story, some details don't add up. Had it been Gonzalo who had gone into that bathroom afraid for his life and put his name on the wall, he never would have written his name as Gonzalo Guzman. We knew that was incorrect. He would not sign his name in that nature. That was the maternal name. He would have used the paternal name. Guzman is his mother's name. He would have written his name as Gonzalo Pazano. Pazano is his father's name. And so right away this was suspicious. And just the whole nature of what he was describing was more like something off of a TV show. The skinheads, the swastika. It just didn't ring true. And so it was suspected that he was trying to come forward for the reward. We looked through the uh, videotape from the SB station during the period of time this employee stated that car had gone by. There was nothing in that videotape that corroborated anything he had told us. No white Monte Carlo, no individuals who could be characterized as skinheads, more importantly, no individual who was a scared Hispanic person being escorted to the bathroom. The examination of the surveillance video at the gas station contradicted Ryan Petty's uh, version of events. And also, one of the issues was he didn't report this right away. When police check Ryan's record, they find more troubling news. He had a pretty checkered past. He was no stranger to the criminal justice system. Some of his arrests were for crimes that would cause you to doubt his honesty. In my mind, we rule it out as pure fabrication. It just was too cute, too stereotypical. The mistake with the Spanish surname, I didn't buy it. With another lead exhausted, investigators face a daunting realization. We reached a point where we were getting nowhere. Leads weren't panning out. Having no significant suspect is very depressing. Really, if you don't solve these cases early on, the longer they go, the likelihood that you're actually going to be able to solve them um, becomes less and less. In cases like this where we're not getting anywhere, especially on a homicide, we took this very personal. Up to that point, this team had not had an unresolved homicide. The lack of progress also adds to the pain suffered by Gonzalo's family. It was very hard. It was very painful to come back from Mexico, and there was no arrest yet. Fue algo fuerte para mí. Mucho dolor. Tenía mucho coraje y mucho odio en mi corazón. Everything was very silent, and we were getting very, very impatient. My mom was getting very impatient with the detectives, and all they told us is to please trust them. So we put our life in their hands. Two more months pass without an arrest. With the case at a standstill, 
Detectives review the entire investigation for something they may have missed. It can be very frustrating when you reach that point where you've kind of hit the wall, but you just have to resolve to redouble your efforts and to keep digging, keep pushing. It was time to go back and look over everybody one more time. We knew that Eddie and Jaime were the last people to see Gonzalo at Saul's house the night of the murder. Even though they'd been interviewed and gave a pretty good account of their activity that night, their boss, Rafael, provided an alibi for them. We wanted to be sure. So at this stage is when we asked them to take a, a polygraph. But when we began to ask them to take a polygraph, they started dodging and weaving. For some reason, they began to balk, and this threw a red flag as to why they weren't coming forward. Again, these are the last two people to see Gonzalo alive, and now they're uh, getting cold feet about taking a polygraph exam. And that's when we really started to think something was wrong. Detectives keep the pressure on Jaime and Eddie, and on September 14th, Eddie comes in for his polygraph. The polygrapher was hooking Eddie up, attaching these leads to him to measure his response. And uh, he doesn't even get to the questions. And Eddie says, okay, I'll tell you what happened. And he immediately makes it clear that he wants to tell everything that happened. In police parlance, he spilled it. Two months after the murder of Gonzalo Pisano Guzman, detectives are re-interviewing witnesses, hoping for a break. Now, Eddie, one of the last people to see Gonzalo alive, has told police he knows more than he's let on. He gave a detailed, recorded statement about what happened on the night of the murder. As he talks to investigators, Eddie drops a bombshell. He disclosed that he had actually been approached by his boss, Rafael, who is Saul's brother, to coordinate delivering Gonzalo to the Forest Hills Country Club parking lot. Eddie told us that it had all been planned out by Raphael. Raphael had enlisted Joe Noble to help with this crime. Joe was Raphael's friend. Eddie went on to tell us that night he and Jaime lured Gonzalo to drive his car to the golf course. And as they pulled up, Joe Noble, appeared with a gun in his hand. And as Eddie and Jaime got out of Gonzalo's car, Noble got into the car, pointing the gun at Gonzalo. And also present in the parking lot was Rafael and his white Ford F-150. Gonzalo was driven away by Rafael and Joe, but Eddie claims he has no idea what happened next. He stated that he and Jaime had left the country club and got into their vehicle, left and went home and went to work as usual. Could the brother of Gonzalo's fiance, Saul, really be behind his brutal murder? It was extremely surprising to suddenly see Rafael Mora as somebody different than this really incredibly self-possessed 19-year-old who started his own business. But according to Eddie, Raphael leads a disturbing double life. Eddie told us that Raphael was a pretty active drug dealer. The nice entrepreneur cover of Raphael was all a lie. He's a significant drug dealer and it appears orchestrated the kidnapping of Gonzalo with Joe Noble. This completely surprised me. Raphael did appear, at least on the surface, to be legit and now he's just not who we thought he was. It was a shock to all of us. The one thing detectives still need to know is why Raphael would want to kill his future brother-in-law. Up to that point in time, there was nothing to link him. There was, there was no motive that anybody could speak of. Investigators first turned their attention to Joe Noble, suspecting he may have been taking orders from Raphael. Joe Noble was uh, known as a small-time criminal. An informant told us he was very concerned about a 40 caliber pistol he had sold to Joe Noble. And he suspected that this may have been the murder weapon used in the killing of Gonzalo. 
that's not the last of the informant's revelations. He said that Joe Noble had talked to a female at one of the local bars and had asked her to alibi for him on that particular night in question. We contacted her. She told us that yes, Joe had asked her to say he was with her on the night of the 6th and most importantly, she said I wasn't with him. Police bring Joe in for questioning. Joe denied having any involvement whatsoever to the murder. During our interview with Joe, he actually tried to use the alibi. And then when we confronted him with the fact that we'd already talked to her and she said it was all BS, then he stopped talking. Joel stated that he wanted an attorney and didn't want to talk anymore. With nothing concrete to hold Joe, police are forced to release him and turn their attention to Raphael. Investigators learned that Raphael's cleaning business was not all that it was purported to be. He had a contract with the Hawthorne Farms Athletic Club. The manager of the health club was not very impressed with the quality of Raphael's work and the work of his crew. It was really a shoddy operation, by all accounts. We considered the fact that the cleaning company may have been a front for Raphael's drug dealing. Raphael told police he was cleaning the gym with Eddie and Jaime the night of Gonzalo's murder. So investigators checked with management in order to corroborate his alibi. The manager of the club said he often couldn't reach him. So he had no idea if he was there or not on the night of the murder. With his alibi falling apart, detectives ask Raphael's sister, Saul, why he might want Gonzalo dead. Saul admitted that Raphael had had a serious talk with her and that it was clear that he was opposed to the wedding, felt she was too young. Raphael did not want Gonzalo marrying Saul. Just did not see Gonzalo as being worthy of marrying into the family. Investigators learned that Raphael would mock Gonzalo for the car he drove. He'd mock him for bringing over a bottle of wine to his parents that was cheap and, and not any good. Raphael held an extreme dislike for Gonzalo. When accompanied by friends, he would go buy Gonzalo's car and talk about keying it or smashing a window out and laughing about it. With the evidence against Raphael stacking up, Police are ready to bring him in for an interview. But there's just one setback. He disappeared. At this point, it's become pretty apparent that Raphael's got something to hide. When you put it all together, there was probable cause to arrest him. With a warrant for Raphael's arrest, police initiate a manhunt. He had a girlfriend named Sandy Montez. We found him hiding at his uh, girlfriend's house. He had dyed his hair orange, and it was obvious that he had done it to try to change his identity. On September 28, 2000, Raphael is officially charged with first-degree kidnapping and aggravated murder. I was, like, in shock. I had so much anger at Rafael. It's an anger I can't explain. Just when police believe they have their man, the investigation takes another shocking turn. We had Rafael in custody when uh, his girlfriend showed up with evidence stating that there is no way he could have been at the murder scene. This raised some obvious concerns. Could it be possible that Rafael was not involved in Gonzalo's murder? It came as an absolute surprise. Police have arrested Rafael Mora in the death of his sister's fiance, Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. But now, Rafael's girlfriend, Cindy, claims she has an alibi for him on the night of the murder. Cindy produced a receipt from a auto detailing place that uh, purported to have dropped off Rafael's vehicle the night of the murder and that Rafael was there and signed for it. It was presented as a solid piece of evidence that Rafael was working at the athletic club the night in question and they had the receipt to prove it. And an individual named Cassandra who owned the company had signed off and was going to be an alibi witness. Checking the validity of the receipt, police interview Cassandra, who admits to being a friend of Raphael. 
With a little bit of prodding by the investigators, uh, she finally admitted that, in fact, the receipt was fake. She confessed it was all a lie, orchestrated by Raphael. It was something that she dummied up because Raphael uh, had asked her to. With Raphael's alibi discredited, investigators turn up the heat on co-conspirator Joe Noble. He told the officers that he hadn't been completely honest. He admitted that he was at the parking lot at the golf course. He was there when the car was burned. He admits the kidnap. He admits to pistol whipping the victim. He said that it was Raphael ordering him to do that. They then picked up Gonzalo, put him in the back of a Ford white pickup truck. And then Raphael drove Joe home with the victim knocked out in the back of the truck. But when he last saw Gonzalo, Gonzalo, uh, albeit knocked out, was still alive. And then supposedly Rafael would have then driven back out to Hag Lake and killed Gonzalo. Detectives have a hard time believing Joe was not there when Gonzalo was finally killed, but have no proof. We had no physical evidence that we could link them to the crime, and it was frustrating. Desperate, investigators obtain security footage from businesses along the route they believe Raphael and Joe would have taken to and from the murder. Something on one of the tapes grabs their attention. We saw Raphael's pickup pull into the gas station to get gas. And lo and behold, there's Joseph Noble getting out of the white Ford and going into the gas station. And the timing of the gas station surveillance footage indicated that would have been probably shortly after the murder. Police also obtain a warrant for Raphael's phone records. Raphael insisted all along that he couldn't have committed the murder because he was miles away cleaning the gym. And lo and behold, at the time of the murder, his phone was not bouncing off the nearest tower to the athletic club. It was bouncing off the nearest tower to Hag Lake, which puts him in the area of the murder. That was huge. I felt ecstatic because I knew in that moment that we had him, and it absolutely conclusively meant that his alibi at the athletic club was false. This was a big moment of actually having some physical evidence. There's a great deal of satisfaction, too, having found the truth. With the new evidence in hand, prosecutors are confident they can secure a conviction. And in 2003, Joe Noble and Rafael Mora are tried together. Both were charged with uh, aggravated murder and with kidnapping in the first degree. At trial, prosecutors present a picture of what they believe happened to Gonzalo the night he was murdered. Rafael did not want him marrying his sister. Rafael was determined to have Gonzalo killed. And so he hatched a plan to get Gonzalo out to the golf course. Lured Gonzalo out there with Eddie and Jaime. After getting out of the car, Gonzalo was beat and pistol whipped and thrown into the back seat of the pickup. Rafael or Joe then set the car on fire and they proceeded to Hag Lake. They drove to an isolated spot. Gonzalo got out of the car. The gun was pointed at him. We believe that he was shot multiple times by Joe. And that Raphael was the one that wanted to get the final word in and stabbed him multiple times in the heart. On the stand, a witness reveals Raphael bragged to him about the murder that Gonzalo was begging for his life, that Gonzalo was promising that he would stop the relationship with Saul, that he would move to Mexico. No one deserves to be killed that way. No one. It was so senseless. It was so senseless. On April 28, 2003, the jury finds Raphael and Joe guilty of Gonzalo's murder. Joe was sentenced to life with a possibility of parole after 25 years. 
Raphael was sentenced to straight life, no possibility of parole. After five years in prison, Raphael appeals his conviction, arguing ineffective counsel. The judge decided that this case should go back to trial, which was a shock to all of us. Ultimately, a decision was made to allow Raphael to plead to manslaughter in the first degree. Raphael's sentence is reduced to 25 years and 10 months. With time served, he will be eligible for early release in 2024. He had no remorse, he had no guilt. He's a monster. Because what he did to us changed our life forever. He destroyed us. Even after everything they've endured, Gonzalo's family remains inspired by his memory. Yo lloré por muchos años, mucho tiempo, y un día yo lo soñé. Yo estoy bien mal. No llores por mí. Yo estoy muy bien. Y yo lo miré riéndose y me dijo que ya no llorara por él, que él estaba bien, que él estaba en paz. He was a happy person that wanted everybody around him to have that same joy and made sure that we were always laughing. Those are the moments that I will always cherish the most. Gonzalo was one of the most genuine men that I've known, that I continue to admire. Hôm nay mười lăm độ không nhỉ nhỉ? Cái này lại hơn ở trên kia 